uh, with the Sachi Chair uh, in Social Policy at UNISA and uh, the UNRIST, but also to uh, be able to broaden the work that uh, we're doing around the memory of Tandika Mkanda to include a robust uh, dissemination program, which uh, many of the participants uh, in today's session uh, might be interested in accessing via our website at Pedestria, where we have been developing uh, a good and comprehensive archive uh, of the work uh, of uh, the late Tadeka Mkandawe. And of course, in the same vein, therefore, to thank the family uh, of uh, uh, Tandika uh, for allowing us to do this and for allowing us to continue sharing in the memory uh, of our departed uh, uh, senior mentor, uh, someone whose imprint on Kodesria in particular, uh, we continue to appreciate uh, every day. Um, today seems to, to be an important day in the sense that we have chosen to zero in uh, on uh, one of Tandika's most profound uh, intervention uh, on the issue of the developmental state. Uh, Tandika pulled a whole range of uh, different thematic uh, issues into a framework that elaborated on the question uh, of development. But for me, perhaps uh, his intervention on the issue of developmental state uh, represents a most powerful intervention. Uh, for the reason that while uh, his article, thinking about the developmental state in Africa, uh, focused on Africa, in fact, what was more interesting about that article is how it drew from a comparative analysis of experiences uh, in the global south. Uh, and I think that uh, this therefore is a really good opportunity for us uh, to proceed uh, with, the, with, the, with the, the work that uh, we have uh, inherited and continue to enjoy uh, from uh, our uh, departed mentor. Uh, to begin the program this morning, I'm going to invite uh, the Vice Principal, um, RPSI, uh, SIC at the University of uh, uh, South Africa, uh, Professor Ujue Meiwa, uh, to give an uh, opening address. And then uh, after that, I will invite uh, both the President of Podesria, Professor Isabel Casimiro, and, uh, and uh, uh, Paul Ladd, the director of UNRIST, uh, to make an intervention before we proceed to the main uh, agenda of the day, which is the memorial lecture. So uh, if I can invite Professor Mayue to give an opening address uh, from uh, UNISA. Thank you. Thanks for that program, Director. I'm sorry, I'm not able to share my video. I'm actually operating from a cell phone, a mobile phone. So I don't want to name and shame the reasons for that here in South Africa at this time, but uh, we, I'm going through what's called load shedding. So I'm not fully, you know, on, 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 on the video, but that as it may be, you can see my picture. I haven't changed much from the last time I took it about two years ago. Um, as a, a disciple, of uh, Tandiga Mkandawara's uh, scholarship, uh, we continue to be inspired uh, by um, his work uh, and also the Saatchi Chair's training and research activities. Now, specifically mandated to do so by the Vice Chancellor and Principal of UNISA, Professor Apuleng. Uh, Lingabula, who sends her apologies and uh, uh, good wishes and greetings and love. Uh, she's asked me to uh, acknowledge the Chancellor of the University of South Africa, former president, uh, His Excellency, Dr. Tabombegi. Um, I also acknowledge her as my uh, line manager and boss. I acknowledge chief organizer and sponsor of the lecture, Professor Adikina. Uh, in social policy, uh, acknowledge a uh, lecture, uh, the presenter, Professor Fiona Trogena um, of the University of Johannesburg. I also acknowledge the 
presenters um, uh, from the various uh, countries around the world who are bracing uh, this lecture for the whole day, being uh, presenters, uh, acknowledged partners of this lecture, the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa and Geneva-based uh, United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. I also acknowledge our various representatives of institutions of higher learning and research councils, uh, UNISA's uh, College of Graduate Studies community um, and its leadership uh, who made uh, this uh, lecture uh, and this memorial possible. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, all protocol is observed. Uh, good morning. Um, a jumbo um, San Bonan. Already aptly expressed by the chair, the program director, uh, I extend a hearty welcome uh, to the second, uh, that is the 2022 Tandigas Memorial Lecture. The concept of gathering and meeting to take decisions, to examine challenges, celebrate victories, or to plan for community or national activities are as old as human societies in Africa. In our own domain as a university, University of South Africa, we practice this culture very actively and through this lecture. As we engage and deliberate, deliberate on a variety of issues, such a tradition informs events such as this one, where we create the space to share ideas that inform our handling uh, of the great resources of our countries and continent. That is the African knowledge and the people, it's people who live in this continent. Of course, uh, doing that with our global partners. Pertinent to the Mkanda Wira scholarship and his memorial lecture, I wish to briefly reflect on a few issues that impact us all. The Western Cape Bay's Trade Law Center has listed a range of challenges that face the continent and that very much reflect uh, the scholarship uh, of Tandira. This can be broadly grouped as issues of broad sustainability that includes food security, inadequate public health systems and provision, poor natural resource management, and lack of rural development. Security that includes crime and violence, wars and terrorism, and threats that we continue to experience across the globe and in Africa, underdeveloped infrastructure that includes poor water, insecure energy supply, poor transportation systems, the developing governance systems that uh, are lacking, including the public sector governance, and indeed the social inequality, including gender inequality and differential race and religious opportunities that are far and weak in between. Now, these uh, challenges, uh, uh, Chair Adesina, should be viewed against the resolve of the African Union to transform the continent into a, a prosperous space. Can you hear me? Have you lost me? I don't know. Uh, but we can still hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, these challenges that I've listed, Program Director, uh, are reverberating the African Union's uh, persuasion to transform the continent into a prosperous space uh, where there's development and stability. And indeed, the 2014 Agenda 2063 Grand uh, Imperative, uh, that is the Africa we want, outlines seven key aspirations that I'm confident. The speakers and the lecture um, at Queen Pin shall take us through all of this today. I don't wanna take you through all of that, but they talk of prosperous Africa, as you know, the Africa with the cultural identity, Africa that's peaceful, Africa that's secure, a strong Africa, a united Africa, an influential Africa, and, Af and Africa is a global player and partner of significance. These aspirations should inform the development trajectory of every organization on this, on this continent, I very much uh, argue. And as a university, our stated vision 
is to be the African university that shapes futures in the service of humanity. And that's so much uh, you will concur with me speaks to Tandereka's uh, scholarship and legacy. Thus, this event is very special to us at UNISA because the social policy chair has created and uh, eventually, as we enjoyed today and have in the past, has created through this memorial lecture a platform, a melting pot of ideas and knowledge exchange, derived from Kandawira's persuasion for a sound development state, local community spaces, small and medium enterprises, policymakers, public and private social actors and academics that impact positively Africa and the globe by extension. This memorial's presentations promise of food for thought that's jam-packed with Kandawira's scholarship from March to end. And for everyone to take home a set of insights and practical ideas to advance intra-Africa trade. Now I mentioned a uh, chair, um, Africa, intra-Africa trade uh, because of the influence that the Africa uh, intra-trade has brought about to recent Africa continental free trade uh, in Africa and uh, by extension actually the conference that we recently had. Mkanda Wira lamented adverse impact of the structural adjustment program in the maladjustment of African economies and societies. Indeed, for us at UNISA, this is an extraordinary way of engaging, drawing from this scholarship. This inclusive way of engaging, the multidisciplinarity that he advanced, gives us hope that the Mahomet task of, of, of the agenda of the Africa continental free trade will give us the Africa we want, free of strife, free of conflicts and wars, free of oppression, free of poverty, free of inequality, and free of bondage. Africa as a continent, globally, sadly, accounts for a total world share of less than 6% of exports and imports, both put together less than 6%, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Thus, the, the intra-Africa trade accounts uh, actually for less than 20% also of intra-Africa trade, something that I'm hoping that today we'll reflect on and actually say, how could we change this? How and how can we change this dim picture is addressed, I'm very much a hopeful and having looked through the presentations that we promised through this memorial lecture and the day that we give to Mkandawira. Redress and success of upholding Mkandawira's legacy hinges on the ability of Africa to resolve, amongst other problems, the limited volume of formal trade and over-concentration on exporting primary commodities, the high non-tariff barriers that exist, the post-colonial divisions and custom protocols that hinder cross-border trade in Africa. My observation is that uh, the literature abounds with reasons why intra-Africa trade is so low and therefore the call by Mkandawira for a developmental state. What makes this event is that the ideas that are gonna be shared on how these anomalies can significantly improve uh, stands out for me even before I uh, engage with the presentations and the lecture. My considered opinion is that the success of advancing Kandawira's uh, legacy will be measured by the impact that we acknowledge and that we shall get from these days' events. This, in a nutshell, is what engaged scholarship should be and must be about to critically engage as a collective in ways that transform our communities. So much, very much, very reverberating Kandika's uh, transformative ways of doing things. In line with UNISA's mission and vision to be critically engaged scholars, I invite you to take at least one idea that you learned from this day to implement it 
and ensure that we keep alive and keep fire in the memory of uh, Tandiga. In my remarks, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, program director, it will be remiss of me not to extend my special gratitude of social policy, uh, Prof. Jimmy, to the sponsors of this um, uh, memorial, to the College of Graduate Studies and partners uh, uh, in making this gathering possible. To all of you participants in this event, I invite you all to play a role in removing the obstacles that stand in the way of an improved Africa, an improved intra-Africa change, uh, and an improve, that is improved from all, all angles, as uh, pointed out by Tandiga. Let us engage, let us hold hands in preparing for a better future for those not born yet, for those that are up to us and for those that we are accountable to. I therefore invite you to open your minds, switch on your inclusive self and allow yourself to be transformed while you transform others with your contributions. Let this be a successful event and declare it open. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mayua, for the extremely stimulating and uh, broad best uh, intervention in the opening address. Uh, I think that you've laid uh, the ground very well uh, for the subsequent interventions, especially uh, with your emphasis on locating uh, uh, the, today's lecture and the work of Tadika in its Pan-African uh, context and also in, in the vision of situating Africa as a key player in the global affairs uh, and uh, uh, the emphasis on the importance of trade is noted and the role of UNISA as an institution that uh, has strategically positioned itself uh, to play an important role in this process uh, is appreciated very much. So thank you very much. We also send back uh, our greetings to, to the uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor uh, Pulen Lengapula, who is uh, uh, very much a child of Podestria, and uh, wish to thank her and UNISA for giving us this opportunity. Uh, moving on, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Isabel Casimiro, uh, the President of Podestria, to uh, make her uh, welcoming address. Uh, Isabel, please. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Greetings, Vice Chancellor, dear Professor Miwa, Vice Principal of UNISA, dear Professor Jimmy Adesina, Director of this program, University of South Africa, UN Research Institute for Social Development, dear Dr. Godwin Murunga, Kodesria Executive Secretary, colleagues and friends. Good morning and afternoon. Today, Mualimu Professor Tandikam Kandawira would be 82 years old. We all know he passed away two and a half years ago. As Kodesria wrote upon his death, Tandika was, and I quote, a brilliant economist and prodigious scholar whose works on African political economy challenged dominant ways of seeing the African continent on a wide range of issues that included structural adjustment and economic reform, democratic politics, neo-patrimonialism, and insurgent violence. End of quote, of quote. This reminds me of the beginning of the Center of African Studies at Eduardo Mondrian University in 1976, when theories and methodologies were challenged and a new way of thinking Mozambique within the Southern Africa region, the continent and the world was constructed. Professor Tandika was, and I quote, an intellectual giant, an incorrigible Pan-African, not confined to the boundaries 
of a national nation state, Ibu Mandaza wrote. I still remember Professor Tandika during the last Kodesria General Assembly in December 2018, always active, defying everybody, discussing ideas, democracy, economic independence, development about the continent and the world. Fortunately, Kodesria honored Professor Tandika when he was alive. It was in a colloquium in Malawi to celebrate his lifetime contributions to global knowledge in April 2016 with his family. This colloquium was to take place five years before with the University of Malawi, but violations of academic freedom led Kodesria to postpone it expressing sympathy with the University Chancellor College lecturers. I always remember when I first met Professor Tandika. It was a Kodesria meeting in Maputo in 1990, before the end of the war with Renamo, at the Kayakwanga Hotel on the Maputo waterfront. I had just been appointed director of the Center of African Studies, the center created by Aquino de Braganza, assassinated with President Samora Machel in October 1986, and where Ruth First, appointed research director, was assassinated in the 17th August 1982. A center full of history of people who participated in the liberation of the African continent, but also of people assassinated and threatened because of the support Frelimo was giving to the fight against apartheid in Southern Africa and for the liberation in the continent. This meeting took place by the previous director, Dr. Sergio Vieira, that died this year a retired coronel from the armed struggle in Mozambique, led by the Mozambican Liberation Front, Relimo, appointed after Aquino de Braganza's assassination, was always around imposing his ideas and not allowing the various members to do their job. Professor Tandika and Professor Wamba Diawamba were not happy with that situation and decided to leave the meeting and the country before its end. I learned from this first cross with Professor Tandika that freedom, democracy, respect, inclusion in the academy and in all the spaces of society are ideas we need to fight for. His life was an example of that, having to leave the country and work elsewhere. We are living difficult times, as Professor Issa Shivji said, in the continent and the world. Academies and academics are at risk. Governments or partners cut their support using various excuses, but we all know what they really want to hit. It is our right to sink, practice and fly for another world of justice and democracy. Let us go on researching and writing challenging dominant ways of seeing the African continent on issues like structural adjustment and economic reform, democratic politics, neo-patrimonialism and insurgent violence still commanding the politics in our times. Kanimambo, Asante Sana, thanks. Uh
Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. And uh, the challenge uh, to continue doing the work is uh, not only appreciated, but also tech, uh, but also the impressive uh, uh, um, catalog of uh, key achievements that tie Padika's work uh, to what uh, ha has happened both in Mozambique and in other places is uh, fully, fully noted and appreciated. Um, can I invite uh, the director of UNRIST, uh, Paul Ladd, to make his uh, intervention, please? Thank you, Godwin, and my thanks also to, to Jimmy. Uh, thank you to Professor Mayua and Professor Kashimiro, and thank you to all of those who are behind this event today. It's, it's an honor to participate. I hope you're all, all well. Um, after I joined UNRIST as director in 2015, I only had the privilege of meeting and talking with Tandika three or four times. Um, one of these, having dinner at Il Chong Yi's house, we talked about, naturally, uh, the state of the world. In the few years before, we'd had a very minor multilateral success on helping to define a new development agenda with contributions from all parts of the world, including uh, from the continent of Africa. Um, but the time was characterized by political tensions, uh, fractures, which were becoming more entrenched. The world of uh, ongoing conflicts in Syria and Yemen, the world of Trump, the world of uh, Brexit. There was an argument that, that I supported that these tensions would never descend again to a more widespread conflict, a world war, and that it couldn't or wouldn't happen in large part because of the linkages that we've grown through globalization itself, the economic activity and trade that bound us uh, together. And Tandika softly, widely cautioned against this optimism, well aware of the irrationality and hatred that can sometimes drive people. And his sage advice seems more prescient today as the conflict in Ukraine grows more intense and the stakes higher for all parts of the world. Not that Tandika was a pessimist. Of course, as has been mentioned, he believed very strongly um, that the potential for economic and social development in all of Africa was real. Moreover, of course, that it should and could be driven not by outsiders, but by African thinkers and leaders. And I think we see that especially from the time that he dedicated not just to the leadership and institution building in Cadestria, but to the generations of cohort, cohorts he carefully guided and who became distinguished scholars uh, after him. I do wonder what he thought when he joined the UN and saw it up close the rules, the procedures, the slow pace of change, often the shallow thinking. I think there was a sense he enjoyed the writing and the thinking much more than the management. Under his tenure, unrest in its unique way continued to be unlike any other part of the UN. Thinking, challenging orthodoxy, keeping power, and politics at the center of all of its analyses. And he left a legacy of work that helped to redefine the scope and centrality of social policy, and not least the benefits of universality. I think he would be proud that UNRIST continues that tradition with inquiries into the role of elites in sustainable development, inequalities and how they can drive and exacerbate crises, on alternative approaches to economic transformation, on gender equality, um, that we continue to act as a bridge to scholars the world over to co-produce research in a completely respectful and shared way. And yet, at the same time, I think he'd have also been disappointed that the role of research in the UN is under ever stricter pressure, that the space for critical thinking 
and for coming up with independent analyses is under threat. He would have been disappointed that his adoptive country, Sweden, has said just last week that it will no longer fund UNRWA from next year after many, many, many years of support. He would have been disappointed that a funding shortfall um, will probably uh, force UNRWA to close next year in its 60th year. And that once those spaces close, they'll be difficult to get back. But today we focus rightly on Tandika and his legacy, and in particular, the feasibility of the developmental state in Africa. I'm really looking forward to the keynote speech. I'm really looking forward to the panel that will be chaired by my colleague, Kachahuya. And I thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for that uh, intervention and welcome address. Um, I'm still digesting part of the message that uh, you've shared with us regarding how Tandika would uh, think about some of the developments that uh, you mentioned in relation to funding of interest. I was going actually to make, uh, uh, before you said it, I was going to make the comment that uh, uh, we would ask uh, one of our colleagues uh, who is online, and this is my way of appreciating his presence, uh, Kwame Njomo Sundaram, uh, what Tandika would think about uh, the pace of change at the UN. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. And uh, perhaps if for no other reason, uh, remembering his interventions on some of these questions would be a powerful reminder of the possibilities uh, that lie ahead, uh, even in a context of difficulties that we continue to experience as institutions keen on and interested in advancing the role of research in uh, policy and policy making. So thank you very much uh, for that intervention. Um, allow me also to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Professor Akila Pasoya uh, online. And I point out Professor Akila Pasoya particularly because he was the president of uh, Codestria uh, from 1995 uh, to 1998, and therefore served as the president of Codestria at a moment of transition uh, when Tadika was completing his tour of service uh, here in Dakar. Uh, and feel welcome uh, to join us for this meeting. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to make a major transition in this uh, uh, session uh, to perhaps what is the main um, uh, agenda of today, and it is uh, the presentation of the Tandika um, Kandawire Memorial Lecture, uh, which today uh, focuses on the topic, um, um, uh, can Africa run industrialization and development in Africa? Uh, this lecture is uh, being delivered by Professor Fiona Tragena. Uh, uh, I have been involved uh, and copied into a range of communications around uh, as we prepared for this particular lecture. Uh, Professor Fiona Tragena is, holds uh, the South African Research Chair uh, in Industrial Development, uh, around which she has also organized uh, a center that is involved in uh, training uh, in research and uh, public engagement. Um, the chair is, uh, 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 is, uh, is a powerful uh, intervention in itself uh, in the work that speaks directly to the work of Tandika Mkandawiri. She is a, a professor uh, of economics uh, currently at the university of Johannesburg um, and her research focuses on issues of uh, um, structural change, uh, industrialization and deindustrialization and innovation and technological uh, um, upgrade. Uh, Professor uh, Togena has published widely in leading journals, uh, received numerous 
awards and grants uh, for her research and led large uh, research projects. She's also co-edited uh, several books and serves uh, on a range of editorial boards of various uh, international journals, uh, including uh, uh, also serving uh, on a range as, a, as editorial advisor on a range of book series. Uh, she's been obviously uh, engaged on many panels, boards, and councils. And perhaps for this particular lecture, it's important to highlight uh, the fact that uh, uh, she also sits on an advisory panel panel for the African Continental Free Trade Area, uh, an advisory council that advises uh, on uh, trade and industrial development across Africa. And also most importantly, she is a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council uh, on economic policy uh, uh, in South Africa, advising uh, the president of South Africa, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, she has advised uh, international organizations, including uh, ONTAN and the United Nations University and the, the International Labor Organization. Uh, clearly has contributed immensely uh, to a number of uh, important uh, uh, United Nations reports. And therefore, uh, was, she is somebody who indeed has made a mark in uh, supporting important uh, international, regional, continental uh, policy uh, frameworks. Uh, Professor Fiona is going to speak today, again, on the topic, Can Africa Run? Uh, industrialization and Development in Africa. And I take note that the uh, question, Can Africa Run, is a play on one of Tandika's uh, key lectures, uh, where Tandika was talking about um, um, running while others walk. Uh, Professor Fiona, please welcome and thank you for agreeing to give uh, this memorial lecture. Um, thank you, Dr. Godwin Murunga and uh, Director of Program, Professor Jimmy Adeshina. It's a singular honor for me to have been invited to deliver the second Tandikam Kandawere Memorial Lecture. And I'd like to recognize the organizers and hosts and um, Kudesria, UNORSID, and the South African Research Chair in Social Policy based at UNISA, um, and in particular, Professor Jimmy Adeshina, uh, for this initiative and for this invitation, and also to pass my respects to the family members present. I greet everybody here, including the other speakers and panelists, and let me just use that uh, South African shortcut to say, all protocol observed. Today's lecture follows the superb inaugural lecture delivered last year by Professor Fontucheru. I'm really humbled to be speaking at an event in memory of such a towering figure as Professor Tandika Mkandawere. Although some of my own uh, gray hairs may suggest otherwise, I'm of course from a different intellectual generation from Tandika and his contemporaries, uh, some of whom are, are here and part of this event, um, who worked closely with Tandika and maintained uh, lasting personal friendships with him. In referring to him here after simply as uh, Tandika, those who know him will understand uh, that no disrespect is intended. In fact, the, the fact that people generally refer to him by his first name is indicative of the, the informality and the affection of his personal relations. In preparing for this lecture, I would turn to a close reading or rereading of uh, Tandika's writings, especially those on industrialization and uh, related issues, which for me was an absolute pleasure and learning experience. And I was really struck by the powerful relevance of his thinking um, to contemporary debates. Some of Tandika's seminal contributions on industrial development and policy um, were written as far back as the 1980s, um, yet four decades later remain highly relevant. For instance, uh, his insights on regional integration are germane to current developments with the AFCFTA. Uh, the issues which he discussed around the financing of industry are very pertinent today. His emphasis on capabilities and technological upgrading resonates with current thinking on technological progress and innovation policy. And the links that he drew between social and industrial policy have a direct bearing on contemporary policy debates, including right here in South Africa, as do his fundamental contributions on the central issue of the developmental state. And I'll be exploring some of these issues further in the course of the lecture. 
on a bit of a personal note, um, going back to Tandika's writings and preparing for this lecture was actually a beautiful opportunity for me to, in a way, uh, reground and to re-engage with some of the big questions of development in Africa. I think sometimes it's it's uh, maybe too easy for us to get uh, immersed in our, our current empirical research projects, uh, for example, looking at uh, econometric analyses across African firms and so on. And of course, uh, through these, uh, one hopes to engage with and, and contribute to these overarching questions. Um, and one always endeavors to, as it were, to keep sight of the wood uh, while looking at the trees in close detail. But for me personally, it's really been valuable to take a step back to my political economy roots and to reflect on some of these larger questions um, in preparing and as I'll be doing uh, in, in the course of the lecture. In framing today's lecture about Africa collectively, it's of course important to recognize the immense diversity within the continent, including when it comes to, to industrialization. And I'll reflect on this in the, in the course of the lecture um, and would just borrow Tandika's words as to why he was referring in aggregate to Africa, quote, I will therefore beg your indulgence to accept that I take the diversity of the continent seriously and to accept also that Africa has a real and tangible social existence that validates it as an area of social study, close quote. As was mentioned in the, the opening of, of uh, this event, industrialization was one of Tandika's central interests alongside with and intertwined with his thinking um, on developmental states, national development, social policy, and his broader approach to political economy and development in Africa. He focused on industrial development and policy, especially in the earlier stages of his work, um, but maintained an interest and continued to engage with and to write about these issues um, throughout his career. I've titled today's lecture, Can Africa Run? Industrialization and Development in Africa. Um, as uh, Professor Murunga rightly pointed out, um, this picks up uh, on and actually pays tribute uh, to, uh, to Tandika's own words in his uh, inaugural lecture for his position as chair at the LSE. And uh, that lecture was subsequently published in the Codesio Journal, African Development in 2011, under the title, Running While Others Walk, Knowledge and the Challenge of Africa's Development. Tandika himself, of course, adapted uh, this concept of uh, running while others work, walk um, from Nyerere's famous declaration that uh, we must run while others walk, through which uh, Nyerere was pointing to the need for Africa to move faster, just simply to catch up with the rest of the world. So drawing on the urgings of Nyerere via Tandika, we ask today, can Africa run? There's no doubt that we need to do so. Indeed, the whole world is now running uh, with technology advancing at an unprecedented pace. Can we here on the continent accelerate industrialization and technological progress and catch up to sustained high growth and development such that an African child born today can live a long, healthy and fulfilled life with the capabilities to learn, contribute, flourish and make meaningful life choices? The reality is that uh, since Nyerere's exhortations in the 1960s about the need for Africa to run, Africa has not caught up, nor even kept up. African countries have been overtaken by Asian countries that were previously poorer, and we also haven't meaningfully narrowed the gap with advanced economies. For example, China was poorer per capita than almost all African countries in the mid to late 1970s, yet now has sped ahead and overtaken and is, is richer per capita than all African countries today, except for the, the Seychelles. Similarly, South Korea previously had levels of income per capita lower than many African countries, but is now a high income economy. The weaknesses of development in Africa, of course, have got multiple explanations, internal and external, historical and more recent, uh, that are beyond the scope of this lecture. I'll be focusing today specifically on industrialization and development, taking an ontological and a long durée approach. Tandika presented figures showing what he characterized as the abnormally low levels of industrialization in African countries at independence. And while there have been some successes, some African countries are actually less industrialized today than his figures show them to have been at independence. In this lecture, I'll start by discussing uh, Tandika's uh, ideas and then present my own views on some of the causes and consequences of Africa's overall uh, weak industrialization. And I'll then be putting forward a vision for transformative industrialization in Africa. So I'll begin by reflecting on Tandika's thinking on industrialization in the context of, of his broad ideas. He consistently emphasized the centrality of structural change and industrialization for Africa's catching up and for broader development. 
I'd characterize his thinking as falling broadly within a structuralist uh, tradition. He, works, he drew explicitly on the Latin American structuralists, especially Prebisch, um, and also on Hirschman, as well as being influenced by Gershenkron. During Tandika's studies in the US and in Sweden in the 1960s, um, and while he was further developing his thinking in the, in the 1970s and 80s, structuralism was very prominent in the theory and practice of development, uh, most strongly, but not only in Latin in America, and was especially influential around the centrality of industrialization and structural change uh, for catching up. He was alive to and engaged with uh, these international debates around structural change and located the structuralist approach within the specific context of African countries, considering in particular colonial history um, and the levels of underdevelopment, um, even relative to the other two major developing regions of the world, uh, Latin America and Asia. And in particular, he considered industrialization and growth in Africa through the lens um, of uh, African countries being what he called the quint quintessential late, late comers to the process of industrialization. In fact, he sometimes referred to African countries as the late, late, late industrializers. Tandika's focus on the centrality of structural change um, can be seen in his view that, quote, the litmus test for any policy is whether it contributes to economic growth and structural change, close quote. Technological upgrading was central to Tandika's conception of late industrialization and catching up. And he highlighted how countries risk being locked in a permanent slow growth trajectory if they stuck to, com to static comparative advantage and fail to advance technologically. He explicitly rejected a linear model of development and technological progress. So that's a teleological view in which technologies are progressively abandoned in advanced economies and then subsequently adopted in developing countries. Instead, and uh, drawing strongly on Gershenkron's concept of late industrialization, he argued that, quote, one of the advantages of late industrialization is access to experiences and knowledge accumulated by the forerunners. Latecomers can telescope development thus adopting certain measures at much earlier stages of their development than the pioneers, close quote. And in a similar vein, he emphasized the importance of learning and productivity for catching up. Tandika was always clear on affirming the primacy of development, and this is cogently captured in his declaration that, quote, Africans do not live by bread alone. This said, bread matters. Thus, while emphasizing the importance of the character of growth and including its distributional character, he wholly rejected any notions um, that growth doesn't matter. Um, in my text, I have some uh, extended uh, quotations from his, his writings, which I think I will, I will pass over in the, in the verbal presentation of the lecture. His views around the importance of industrialization for Africa and the direct causal links between industrialization and catching up were strengthened by the astounding success of East Asian industrialization and growth. For some people today, uh, this might be a matter of economic history, but Tandika lived through this and could directly observe the transformation of, Afri of uh, East Asian economies and, and societies. And these successes in East Asia um, stood in stark contrast with some of the failures of industrialization and, and growth in many African countries over the same period, especially when set back by the structural adjustment programs. So he could see how East Asian uh, countries that had been poorer than most African economies overtook their African counterparts and uh, sped up to their advanced economies. And for Tandika, I think this empirical experience uh, reinforced his structures inspired views about the importance of industrialization for Africa. From the East Asian experience, um, Tandika drew lessons about the importance of a, a dynamic rather than static notion of comparative advantage. And he looked in particular to the active industrial policies that these countries implemented in order to develop future comparative advantages in industries in which they were not yet competitive. And he pointedly uh, contrasts this with IMF advice based on concepts of static, static allocative efficiency. Where Tandika departed from the East Asian experience, including in terms of its lessons for African countries, was in his own unshakable insistence on democracy. He argued forcefully that democracy and development are compatible and that countries need not choose between them. Specifically, he argued that countries can industrialize and grow with democratic rather than authoritarian states. And in this, he drew explicitly on the characteristics that he admired in the Nordic countries and how they had successfully developed with and through democracy. Tandika traced the historical phases of industrialization and deindustrialization in Africa and the determinants of these changes. 
And he argued that uh, for different reasons at, at different times, including colonialism and the structural adjustment programs, African countries were often out of sync with the rest of the world in industrialization. Going back to the phase of industrialization in, in uh, many other parts of uh, developing regions between 1914 and 1945, he points out that Africa largely lost out on this uh, due to colonialism. So whereas other developing countries were able to pursue import substituting industrialization during this time, um, which they financed either through borrowing or through debt defaults, um, African countries, which were under the colonial yoke, couldn't protect their own domestic markets as a basis for industrialization, nor could they even run deficits to finance industrialization. So with the exceptions of the special cases of uh, South Africa and the then Rhodesia during this time, he contrasts the experience of colonialism with the experiences of Latin America and even India, whose industrialization during the same period, that's up to 1945, was to lay the basis for their own uh, post-World War II industrialization. And it shows that as a result, at independence, African countries were among the least industrialized countries in the world. Observing that the subsequent phase of uh, ISI in, in Africa post-independence was short, less than a decade in most countries, and actually very different substantively from that in Latin America, Tandiko rejected narratives blaming ISI for Africa's uh, economic problems. And he really um, exposed the bankruptcy of characterizations of neo-patrimonialism as just lazy explanations for the poor development outcomes in Africa. The 1980 Lagos uh, Plan of Action emphasized the importance of industrialization, seeing as this, seeing this as central to Africa's development and to self-sufficiency. But the plan was effectively superseded by the Berg Report and the Structural Adjustment Programs, I'll refer to here after as, as the SAPs, and its recommendations were largely not implemented. Tandika's strong views about the centrality of structural change and industrialization for Africa led to his serious concerns about the deindustrialization that he observed in many African countries uh, from the early 1980s following the SAPs. And he was perhaps uh, uh, the first or amongst the first uh, analysts of deindustrialization in Africa. He pointed out that a number of African countries had actually been on positive uh, growth and development tracks prior to the SAPs and had made progress in, in industrialization, growth, and in development. And he directly identifies uh, deindustrialization in Africa in the 1980s as part of uh, what he termed the maladjustment caused by the SAPs. At the same time, he's also recognizing underlying domestic political economy factors that enable this reversal, which I'll discuss uh, further shortly. So he showed how um, African countries' uh, economies were devastated and had their development pathways uh, derailed by the SAPs. For Tandika, this wasn't just something to be uh, written about in academic papers, but something that he felt uh, deeply and viscerally as a wound inflicted on the continent. In addition to SAPs, he identifies two primary sources of the failures of industrialization in Africa from the 1980s. Firstly, external shocks, uh, in particular deteriorating terms of trade and heavy external debts, leading to foreign exchange constraints on the import of intermediate inputs uh, needed for industrialization. And secondly, uh, weak institutions and weak industrial capabilities that hampered modernization and competitiveness in industry. Tandeko remarked that, quote, to talk of deindustrialization in a continent that is least industrialized in the world may seem merely faddish, close quote. Yet he argues forcefully that deindustrialization in Africa from the 1980s was not inevitable and that it acted as a break on Africa's growth and development. He warned that, quote, the dismissal of deliberate strategic industrial and trade policies to shape Africa's position in the global trading system runs the distinct danger of leaving Africa on the low productivity, low growth path, close quote. Uh, a warning that uh, unfortunately uh, described what indeed unfolded in uh, some African countries. As with any issues to which he turned his gaze, Tandika looked at issues of industrial development through the lens of critical political economy that was the hallmark of his approach. And this approach can be summed up in his observation that, quote, industrialization and its reversal are quintessentially political, close quote. His analysis of the early failures of industrialization and of deindustrialization in Africa in the early 1980s didn't simplistically attribute these only to the SAPs, and uh, nor did he cast African governments just as the hapless victims of the international financial institutions. Tandika critiqued the class basis of African industrialization, which he seen as, sees in part uh, as resulting from the colonial legacy. Unlike Asia and Latin America, 
African countries at independence lacked a strong and autonomous indigenous bourgeoisie that could drive the industrialization project. He argues that class and state structures made industrialization in Africa socially rootless, rootless and contrasts this with India and Latin America. He thus argues that, quote, industrialization in Africa was strictly speaking, not a class project. It was essentially a nationalist program and as such lacked the sharpness and purposefulness of a class determined project, close quote. The weak social and class basis and lack of broad-based ownership of industrialization were fundamental weaknesses of the industrialization project and made it vulnerable to reversal, as indeed happened under the, the SAPs. Uh, in this regard, Tandika observes that, quote, the weak base of the industrialization process is revealed by the fact that outside of labor and a few nationalist groups, deindustrialization has not received much resistance internally. And um, moving on, um, it would be remiss to reflect on Tandika's uh, perspective on industrialization without bringing in social policy and his novel linking of innovation, industrial policy and social policy. This wasn't done as a uh, forced marriage, um, considering that he had earlier focused on industrialization and then after joining UNOSID, turned his attention more to social policy. Rather, he was able to organically uh, uh, link industrial and social policy in a novel way through an integrated development lens. So he argued that in addition to the direct role of social policy in protecting the vulnerable and improving people's quality of life, social policy played a productive role in the development process. Tandika's uh, conceptualization of social policy can be understood as part of his broader perspective on, on catching up, um, drawing theoretically on structuralism and on Gershenkron in particular, um, and adapted to the African context. He understood social policy as closely linked to the innovation and the technological progress that are needed for late industrializers to catch up. He pointed out that rapid industrialization produces enormous social dislocations and strains, challenging the social acceptance of innovations. So for him, this accentuates the role of social policy in cushioning these dislocations and strains, both to protect those negatively affected and as part of building wide support for innovation and industrialization, despite these uneven distributional effects. A second key role of social policy in this context lies in building the capabilities needed for technological progress, industrialization and growth. Another way in which he linked uh, social and industrial policy was in the financing of industrialization. So drawing on the Scandinavian experience, he observed how public pension funds um, as part of social policy were instrumental in the domestic financing of industrialization. Let me turn to Tandika's thinking on trade and industrialization and uh, regional integration. He had strong views on trade orientation um, and, and on the international development debates of the time around import substituting industrialization, ISI, and export-oriented uh, industrialization, EOI. And he critiqued what he saw as a, as a false binary between these um, and also as the mischaracterization of the, the East Asian experience um, as, as simply EOI. As I mentioned earlier, he, he emphasized that the period of ISI in, in uh, Africa was actually short, and he rejected uh, neo-patrimonialist explanations, both for the adoption of ISI, as well as accounts blaming ISI for Africa's economic problems. He had his own concerns about ISI in Africa, but these were different. And one of these was that uh, the manner in which it was implemented actually undermined uh, regional integration. Um, in addition, he attributes the failures of regional integration to the continued uh, divide and rule tactics of, of the neo-colonial uh, powers um, and, and, and to SAPs. And then internally, he, he lamented what he called the petty nationalism um, generated both by the nature of colonial rule and by the choices made by nationalist movements, which actually led to little progress um, in, in regional cooperation. But he emphasized the integral relationship between regional integration and industrialization in Africa. And he saw regional integration as being of enduring importance uh, for growth and development. Time doesn't permit me to discuss all aspects of uh, Tandika's approach uh, to industrialization. And there's much more that I would have liked to have said about uh, the role of the state, the financing of industrialization, his critique of narrow environmentalism, um, among other issues. I've tried to bring out um, and to engage with his emphasis on the importance of industrialization for Africa's development, his concerns around earlier deindustrialization. Um, and in particular, his views on, on trade and regional integration and, and the links with the social policy. Crucially, he considered all of these issues through the lens of critical political economy, never shying away from challenging dominant orthodoxies.
Having engaged with Tandika's thinking and contributions on industrialization, I'll now set out my own stall on industrialization in Africa. While explanations for poor growth and development in Africa, of course, need to be multifaceted and country specific, I'd contend that the failures of industrialization are an important part of the story. As discussed, uh, industrialization in Africa has been stop start and most countries have never reached significant levels of industrialization up until today. In previous writings, I've characterized this phenomenon in, in some African countries as not only premature uh, deindustrialization, but as pre-industrial deindustrialization. So this is in the sense of beginning to industrialize before even industrializing in any meaningful sense. Now they can't have, of course, been successes within countries and at particular times, including at present, there are success stories and in particular sectors, but this is an overall uh, long durée appraisal. And it's, it's not only in terms of low manufacturing shares, but the weaknesses of African industrialization are manifest in uh, generally low technology intensity in manufacturing, uh, weak productive capabilities, poor competitiveness and export performance, and manufacturing not strongly pulling along other sectors as an engine of economic growth. Beyond the negative effects on economic growth, uh, deindustrialization is also likely to have negatively affected wider socioeconomic development in Africa, including uh, the levels of uh, poverty, um, and poverty and other developmental outcomes. Even beyond this, I would argue that the failures of industrialization in Africa have had wider social and political economy effects. Industrialization that is deep um, and sustained has profound and irreversible effects on a society. And these kinds of effects are evident, for example, in how the first industrial revolution transformed European economies and societies. These effects, which are not necessarily all positive, reach far beyond matters of productivity and growth. So here we're talking about the transformative effects of industrialization on social and class relations and on a country's broader political economy. Industrialization is class formative. So there's no route to proletarianization and formation of a working class other than through industrializing. And uh, internationally and historically, it's also through industrialization that countries have typically developed a robust uh, middle class. Industrialization also forms the basis for the establishment of a national bourgeoisie as a class that, is, that has the ability to drive nation's economic progress in ways that, for example, the agrarian uh, land owning classes could not. One dimension of the class uh, formative effects of industrialization is uh, perhaps the subjective one of class identities. Any individual's identity uh, may always be kind of overdetermined in an Althusserian sense. For example, religious, national, ethnic, class, gender, and, and other identities. I would suggest that for the overwhelming majority of, of the poor and uh, the working class in the broadest possible sense in Africa, class identity or class consciousness would not be among the foremost of the identities. In various uh, civil and uh, cross-country conflicts in Africa over time, uh, the young men directly involved as protagonists are often of the same class or socioeconomic status. One wonders uh, whether all of these conflicts would have been as prevalent had the countries become industrialized and prosperous, and if they themselves had regular and unionized factory jobs. Now, this is of course not to suggest that uh, industrialization is in itself a recipe for peace. Uh, if anything, the various conflicts between industrialized European countries, including the two world wars of the last century, could readily disabuse us of such a notion. Yet my point is that with weak or incomplete uh, class formation and the associated weaknesses in uh, working class organizations and consciousness, combined with the persistent economic uh, deprivation and perceived lack of economic prospects, under those circumstances, other identities, such as religious or ethnic identities, are likely to become more prominent. Beyond uh, subjective identities and consciousness, industrialized economies are generally less conflict prone than those dependent on uh, natural resources. There's an extensive literature on the links between uh, natural resource dependence, and um, particularly minerals and conflict. And one aspect of this is uh, the high value and portability of minerals, for example, diamonds, relative to most manufactured goods. In terms of electoral uh, politics, um, and, and not shying away from controversy here, um, the electoral platforms that are typically on offer in African countries can generally not be characterized along the same uh, left to right ideological spectrum as in other parts of the world. Of course, economic issues do feature, for example, around uh, food prices and food security, job creation, and so on. 
But uh, voting in many countries um, tends to more strongly follow uh, regional or ethnic patterns more than socioeconomic status. And I would suggest that incomplete class formation in societies um, that have strongly pre-industrial uh, characteristics and economic deprivation um, mean that uh, traditional notions of class where we have uh, limited uh, applicability and uh, need to uh, be adapted to these con to these such contexts. Again, just to be clear, I, I do not want to essentialize or romanticize industrialization. It would of course be absurd or, and reductionist um, to attribute uh, the range of, of complex and context specific challenges across Africa to the failures of industrialization, as it would be uh, ridiculous to advocate industrialization as the only silver bullet for Africa's underdevelopment. It's quite well established and it's been discussed uh, over the years how the political economy conditions for and the political constraints on industrialization, or how, how political economy conditions um, affect industrialization. So my argument here is that this relationship is a dialectical one. So the successes and the failures of industrialization also in the other direction partially shape a country's political economy. Or to put it differently, a country's political economy is to some extent endogenous to industrialization. So without being uh, hopefully too crudely materialist or mechanistic, um, I think this is part of the influence of uh, productive relations on social relations. One policy implication of this is that countries cannot uh, just wait for the right political economy conditions um, before implementing industrial development or policy. Of course, we need to recognize that political economy configurations in different countries may be differentially uh, conducive to industrialization but it's also important for countries to just get on with it. Industrialization that's of sufficient scale and duration will itself, at least to some extent, shape political economy conditions. And one aspect of this is that industrialization actually changes the balance of economic power within countries, uh, as well as uh, to some extent internationally. Within a market-based or, or mixed economy, sustaining industrial development requires vesting the industrialization project within a vigorous indigenous national bourgeoisie. And beyond a, a narrow class fraction um, of uh, owners directly of industrial capital, a deep rooting of industrialization also requires that other fractions of capital depend on the continuity and success of industrialization. Uh, so fractions of capital beyond industrial capital, including through intersectoral linkages. What have sometimes been referred to as uh, vested interests have often been condemned in a manner that I think uh, quite bizarrely uh, suggests that there are any issues or processes in which there are somehow magically no stakes or interests. We do need interests that are deeply vested and invested in the success of the industrialization project. And this is not as uh, merely as rent seeking beneficiaries of state largesse but as a range of stakeholders prepared to fight, uh, not literally, for industrialization. This is essential to avoiding the stop-start patterns of industrialization that have been the experience of many African countries. And here I'm not even referring so much to the early experiences of the structural adjustment, but in more recent years to inconsistent support for industrialization in many countries. If industrial policy is seen as a system of patronage to be doled out as payback for electoral support and then to be reversed by the next administration, industrialization will not go anywhere. For industrialization in Africa to be sustained, it thus needs to be socially rooted. So having a strong class and broader base, including in the state bureaucracy. So this means a depth and breadth of interests across fractions of capital and across classes, as well as across regions of a country and across ethnic groups, interests that are vested in the success and continuation of industrialization. Weak state capacity is one of the arguments that have been voiced in some quarters against an industrial policy agenda in Africa. Uh, curiously, perhaps uh, this argument is usually applied specifically to industrial policy. So we don't hear arguments that no, African governments shouldn't undertake macroeconomic policy because of weak state capacity. It's, uh, these arguments are made uh, in particular for industrial policy. Um, I would argue instead that state capacity and state capabilities are at least to some extent endogenous to what a state actually does. So a weak and a hands-off state that doesn't undertake active industrial policy simply will not build up the capabilities to do so. And these kinds of capabilities also can't be built up just by sending public servants on training courses. It's through the actual design and implementation of industrial policy that these public sector capabilities are built up. 
So what we might call learning by doing at the policy level. There will be failures and there will be cases where scarce public resources are not optimally used as has happened in industrial policy all around the world. What matters is learning from these failures and strengthening industrial policy capabilities uh, through practice. To return to the issue of uh, why industrialization for Africa, not only uh, the theory of economic development, but the experiences of development across countries and over time show the importance of industrialization for the development process. We can observe that internationally, there are very few country experiences of sustained fast growth without industrialization. And here I'm not only referring to the successful catching up experiences of developing countries over the past uh, six decades or so, but also going further back to the longer experiences of how the advanced economies of today became wealthy. Manufacturing has certain characteristics that enabled it to play a special role as an engine of growth. I won't have time to go into these in, in, in detail in the lecture, but I think it's also important to recognize that there is a high degree of uh, heterogeneity in each sector of the economy, the diversity of activities, and that some activities within services or agriculture will have these growth pulling properties more strongly than some activities within manufacturing. There's also growing integration between sectors and a fuzziness of sector boundaries. I would thus put forward a, a nuanced view that takes into account both sector specificity and activity specificity and promotes dynamic activities uh, within any sector, while still maintaining that there are common denominators across manufacturing activities um, that are relevant to growth, and hence that industrialization remains key um, to growth and development in Africa as well as more widely. In recent times, uh, there have been debates around whether services can act as an alternative engine of growth in Africa. It's true that services account now for much of employment in Africa, um, that there's great diversity within the services sector, and that there are pockets of services activities um, that are high productivity, high skilled, and, and could be strongly growth pulling. But in aggregate at this stage, I would have no confidence in the viability of the services sector as a whole for driving growth in African economies, in the sense of pulling along other sectors and enabling African countries to catch up with more advanced economies. The reasons for this, um, in addition to uh, the inherent characteristics of uh, activities within uh, different sectors, um, one reason is the low levels um, of development in the continent. So without having fully industrialized and still in most countries being at relatively low levels of income per capita, it's not feasible to transition on a significant scale economy-wide into the kinds of high productivity, advanced uh, tradable services that could serve as alternative engines of growth. And this is in contrast uh, to the nature and scale and role of services in some of the richest countries of the world that have already undergone long and deep uh, industrialization, even if they've since uh, deindustrialized, through which they've built strong productive capabilities and uh, have complex and diversified economies uh, with dense linkages and learning channels. In contrast, in African countries, notwithstanding some important exceptions, services are largely informal. Uh, relatively low skills, low productivity, low technology, and with limited tradability. I sometimes feel that arguments around the potential of services to act as an alternative engine of growth in Africa don't always have a strong uh, scientific basis, and sometimes uh, smack rather of attempts to rationalize uh, some of the failures of industrialization in Africa, or perhaps a despondency about the prospects of successful industrialization, or simply a lack of political will to activate uh, the bold measures needed to support industrialization. I'll now move to talk about the importance of regional integration for industrialization in Africa. It's well recognized that domestic markets in many African countries are too small to serve as a springboard for industrialization. It's difficult to achieve the required economies of scale. And this points to the importance of regional integration as a core part of the continent's industrialization pathway. Africa's combined population is about the same as that of China and potentially provides a good basis for Africa's industrialization. The AFCFTA is a fundamental development with the potential to be a game changer for industrial development in Africa. And the broader goals of the AFCFTA explicitly include structural transformation and industrialization with a vision in which these are integrally intertwined with trade and regional integration. Beyond any immediate economic benefits, the AFCFTA can be understood as one part of giving effect to post-independence dreams of united Africa, pan-Africanism and economic independence. And without wanting to overly romanticize the AFCFTA in the spirit, I think it is important for any uh, regional integration project to be animated by a deeper vision that uh, goes beyond economic uh, benefits. 
As with any processes of regional integration, there will inevitably be uh, winners and losers, at least uh, relatively, based on prior conditions and on policy choices as to how the integration unfolds. And one particular concern here is ensuring that nascent manufacturing sectors in the poorer and least uh, industrialized countries of, of the continent are not thwarted by increased manufacturing imports from the more advanced industrialized economies. This underscores the importance of active steps to build manufacturing productive capabilities in the less advanced economies, including through their productive integration in regional value chains. And another issue here is that um, removing trade barriers is, of course, only part of what is needed to significantly upscale trade within the continent. Among the other issues uh, that need to be addressed are non-tariff barriers, infrastructural deficiencies, and uh, border delays. Um, due to time, I'm going to uh, skip uh, some of the, the areas of industrialization in Africa that I, I uh, would have liked to talk about, uh, specifically technological upgrading and uh, green industrialization, uh, as important as they are. And to come to the final part of, of the lecture um, on what I'm terming transformative industrialization for Africa, or TIFA. As I've argued, um, drawing on theory and on the historical experiences of, international, of industrialization internationally and over time, Deep and sustained industrialization can be transformative, not only economically, but also socially and politically. So this concept of transformative industrialization is broader than that of structural transformation. I identify four dimensions of industrialization being potentially transformative. Firstly, it needs to be disruptive. So disruptive of existing political economies, existing patterns of comparative advantage, production systems, social relations, and so on that are suboptimal for growth and development. Secondly, it needs to be catalytic. So catalytic of wider so uh, social and economic change. And thirdly, this impact needs to be systemic. So going more widely beyond growth and even beyond just the economy. It needs to be long lasting. So not stop start and with long-term transformative effects that could endure even post-industrialization. To make this a little more concrete, uh, the transformative effects of industrialization in the economic domain would include, for example, catalyzing upgrading in other sectors of the economy, contributing to economy-wide productive capabilities, and generating positive feedback loops and cumulative productivity increases. And beyond the, the economic domain, the transformative effects of industrialization would include the influence on a country's political economy conditions and social relations, as I discussed earlier. Also, a, a range of wider effects such as uh, urbanization, modernization, uh, change in gender relations, and so on. So without uh, making the mistake of asking too much of industrialization, it does also need to contribute to societal grand challenges, such as employment creation, poverty reduction, uh, gender equality, and so on. I would suggest that industrialization in Africa needs to meet certain conditions to be transformative. Firstly, scale is important. And here is including simply uh, the shares of manufacturing and GDP and total employment. So if manufacturing is of insignificant scale in an economy, and there's a lack of depth of industrialization, it's uh, for example, less than 5% of a country's economy, it can't have a broader transformative impact. Furthermore, uh, while there'll always be heterogeneity within each, se each sector, on balance, the manufacturing sector needs to have higher productivity, greater complexity, and to be more innovative and technology intensive than the rest of the domestic economy on average in order to play that progressive uh, transformative role. In addition, uh, manufacturing needs to have strong and dense linkages with the rest of the domestic economy, not only to pull along the rest of an economy, but also to have that uh, transformative impact. And here I'm referring not only to forward and backward linkages, but also to technological linkages and spillovers, learning and transfers of knowledge and skills and so on. Let me illustrate a TIFA approach a bit more practically by contrasting it uh, with a narrow industrialization approach on the specific policy of issue of uh, industrial hubs. And by industrial hubs, I'm referring collectively to industrial zones, uh, districts and parks, special economic zones and so on. Industrial hubs have been implemented in, in different forms and with uh, different purposes across Africa and beyond uh, with varying results. So my intention here is not to focus on industrial hubs per se, but to illustrate what is different in a TIFA approach um, but with references uh, to policy towards industrial hubs. So rather than being comparative advantage conforming or basing production choices on st static comparative advantage, from a TIFA perspective, their production and in industrial hubs needs to be based on dynamic comparative advantage or be comparative advantage defined. So related to this, 
rather than hubs just being places to produce more of the same of what is already produced in the rest of an economy. A TIFA approach emphasizes the role of hubs in diversification and upgrading from a country's existing production profile. While countries are at different levels of development and cannot all pitch at the global technological frontier, production in hubs needs to at least push the envelope of a country's own technological frontier. Furthermore, to be transformative, hubs cannot operate as enclaves, but need to be integrated with the domestic economy through multiple linkages and channels. And again, this isn't only forward and backward linkages through supply chains, um, but a wider set of linkages. A policy approach to industrial hubs from a TIFA perspective wouldn't aim to attract firms based just on exemptions, low wages and poor working conditions uh, than in the rest of an economy. But rather the attraction should be based on positive support um, on the benefits of firm agglomeration and on export opportunities from hubs. A TIFA policy approach to hubs doesn't treat them in isolation, but instead hubs policy would be integrated with wider industrial, trade, innovation, environmental and other policies. So this sort of approach is a radical departure from the experience of industrial hubs um, in, in some countries, uh, not only in Africa, where in, in, in certain instances, hubs, uh, for example, in some EPZs uh, have just been a, a glorified sweatshop doing final assembly activities uh, that generate some foreign exchange and create some low-wage jobs, but without contributing to upgrading and to deepening a country's uh, industrialization. A TIFA perspective recognizes the potential of hubs to support upgrading, um, to raise the scope for cumulative productivity increases, to build productive capabilities and so on, especially in African countries with only nascent manufacturing sectors. What's crucial for transformative industrialization is that these effects extend firstly into the rest of a domestic economy beyond hubs, and secondly, into other sectors outside of manufacturing. And I think we have seen uh, in, in countries such as Ethiopia, some of the success of industrial hubs. So I've used the example of industrial hubs to illustrate what distinguishes a TIFA approach. And we could extend the same logic to distinguish a TIFA approach to various other industrial policy issues. It's crucial to note that there's no one size fits all. Policy needs to take account of country specificities as well as even subnational uh, specificities. So TIFA will, will mean different things in different country contexts. It's an ambitious agenda asking us to look with fresh eyes at the potential of industrialization and to aim at a big push as part of new development pathways uh, for African countries. I'm now going to move to my, my final concluding remarks. In noting that global conditions have changed uh, since the rapid industrialization successes of the four original East Asian tigers, Tandika opined in 1988 as follows, quote, so obviously, whatever industrialization miracles take place, or for what that matter, whatever reversal of the deindustrialization process Africa achieves, it will be under radically different conditions. There can, however, be no doubt that the current process of deindustrialization, the dismantling of structures that sustain much of the industrialization, the institution of social structures of accumulation that are highly volatile, will once again leave Africa unprepared to capture whatever new opportunities an upturn in the world economy may have. Close quote. These prescient words from Tandika, penned about a third of a century ago under different continental and global conditions, remain relevant regarding the, the problems of African industrialization, um, but to its enduring importance, and in highlighting how underlying economic weaknesses constrain African countries from taking advantage of emerging opportunities. Yet we do have cause to be more optimistic now. The structural adjustment programs uh, that Tandika discussed at length dealt a long lasting blow to African industrialization. Path dependency, feedback loops and cumulative causation mean that what could have been a virtuous circle of building capabilities, upgrading and ind industrialization and growth instead became a low equilibrium trap. When productive capabilities are broken down through deindustrialization, this can't be easily reversed. And the collective nature of capabilities and of learning by doing mean that this has broader negative effects uh, beyond individual firms. Had Africa been able to maintain pre-structural adjustment rates of industrialization and, and, or growth, or to follow pathways closer to Asian counterparts, the continent would be very different today. We must own up, however, that very different choices could have been made at least in the more than three decades since the structural adjustment programs. 
there's a dialectic between factors that are internal and external to a country. And countries do make choices. That in turn, these choices have implications for the balance of forces domestically and internationally, as well as for countries' own policy space. Even within historical and current uh, global constraints, African states do have agency. And to be honest, have not been prevented from pursuing active industrial policy over all of these intervening years since the structural adjustment programs. Of course, there's always issues of limited financial resources, capacity constraints, and so on. But it's in countries' domestic political economy that we can actually understand the failure to pursue effective industrial policy in most, not all, but most countries of the continent over the past few decades. Industrial policy has made a comeback in Africa, and I think that's even before its more recent uh, comeback internationally. Industrial development and policy now feature prominently in the visions and the policy documents of, of governments across the continent, as well as regional and continent-wide bodies. There's an ongoing battle of ideas around the scope, the purpose, the instruments of industrial policy, and how this connects with other policy domains, such as macroeconomic and financial policy. Furthermore, implementation and outcomes have been uneven. The industrialization successes of countries such as Ethiopia serve to demonstrate the possibilities of success in the continent, even in low-income countries with limited resources, where there is the political will to industrialize and concrete actions actually implemented to actualize this. Consistent with the changing fortunes of industrial policy in Africa has been changing interest in this field within academic research. So in the 1980s and 1990s, there was actually a dearth of research um, on industrial development and policy in the, in, in the continent. And I think that as well as the general struggles of many African universities during this time um, and the reliance on, on donor or consultancy funds for research, as well as the practical weaknesses of industrial development uh, during this period, meant that economic research in the continent was overwhelmingly focused on, on different issues. During this hiatus, Tandika was one of the few to continue impactful research uh, in this field in Africa, along with some others based uh, in or outside of the continent, and I see that uh, some of those are, are, are part of this virtual event today. So we can actually observe a generational gap um, in African researchers uh, specialized in these issues. And for me, it's exciting to see the upsurge in interest and in active research in this field across the continent, especially among scholars. For example, a few months back, we held the second uh, Young Scholars Conference on Structural Chain and Industrial Policy in Africa, um, and in the presentation of, of, of many excellent papers in this field from across the continent. And I see some of the presenters are here in this um, virtual call today. We need ambitious research agendas that connect with the fundamental development questions facing African countries. So in my final words, um, we've seen the rise and the fall and possibly now the rise of industrial policy in Africa. Hopefully the current emphasis on industrial policy will be sustained and there'll be the intentionality and the political will to make daring and sometimes difficult choices and to boldly implement on the kind of scale that can make a difference. Transformative industrialization for Africa could be part of an ambitious pathway contributing towards this. Let's reignite our ambitions of development and reimagine uh, an industrialized, prosperous and integrated Africa. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Fiona Tregena for this um, really, really uh, deep analysis, not just of industrialization, but actually development. Uh, very firmly located in the, uh, in the work uh, that Tandika did. And um, I'm not going to attempt a summary of this, but to make an appreciation really uh, that you've touched uh, not just the core of what Tandika thought, but really you developed it in a manner that uh, speaks directly to what I believe uh, Professor Jimmy Adesina's team in UNISA, Podestria, and UNRIST were expecting. And as you spoke, uh, I was consistently reminded of an article that uh, Tandika published uh, in the African Sociological Review uh, titled Social Sciences and Democracy, Debates in Africa, uh, where he reminded us that uh, in 1986 uh, at a Kodesria General Assembly, 
uh, reflecting on the notion of political economy. Uh, he actually warned uh, against a variant of political economy uh, that entailed bad economics, bad political sociology, and a little history. Uh, and uh, I go on to this point to make the point that uh, uh, you gave us nearly enough political sociology, enough history, uh, good economics, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, I, I just want to appreciate that uh, uh, you've been able to remind us of some of the key concepts and theories uh, that have informed the work of Tandika. Uh, you've been able to marshal uh, a deep understanding of the methodology that uh, informed his work. And uh, clearly, you've also touched on the comparative nature of the work that Tandika did in relation to the work on industrialization in particular, but development uh, in general. Uh, and your notion of um, a critical political economy, I think would satisfy Tandika as a, essentially uh, uh, adhering to the warning that he gave in 1986. Uh, you obviously concluded with uh, what I thought was a very powerful point uh, on transformative industrialization, pointing out uh, the need for it to be uh, disruptive, uh, catalytic, and systemic. And uh, uh, it mimics also the notion of transformative social policy. Uh, and your point uh, on the need for industrialization to be socially rooted, I thought was a very powerful way of framing, not just a critique of what has not worked, but actually helping locate uh, the process of industrialization in its important context. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you very much for this. Um, having said that, uh, I want to uh, invite uh, colleagues listening to us uh, for a brief session, a question and answer session. Uh, I think we are happy to take questions uh, via the Q&A uh, function on Zoom. Um, and uh, I am also happy to uh, to use my screen to identify anybody who has raised uh, their hand who would like to speak. Uh, I have a team of colleagues who will uh, enable uh, uh, those ones who are unable to, uh, to be able to speak directly. So uh, please feel free to ask uh, any questions you have. I have roughly 20 minutes to do this. I'm likely to eat into the 30 minutes of break, uh, but uh, I think we will manage. Uh, as I wait to uh, see any hand that is uh, is uh, is uh, is up, uh, I take note that uh, uh, we have an anonymous attendee uh, who has asked a, a question, and uh, I don't know to whom that question is directed. Uh, but as I wait for colleagues to raise up their hands, somebody has said, "Who can we now regard as a scholar with similar caliber and conviction?" Uh, that pushes forward some of the of Tandika's thesis, uh, or is this, or is this? Are we now left in a vacuum? I, uh, somebody raised that question uh, in the Q and A uh, section of uh, of our uh, of our system. Uh, if Yona wants to attempt a, a response to that, uh, you're welcome. Jimmy Adeshina, if you want to attempt a response to that, uh, you are welcome. But I also want to take note that we uh, uh, received uh, uh, essentially a, a comment that says, "What a wealth! Uh, what a wealth of what a well of wealth!" And uh, congratulations to Professor Togene. Um, I don't have any question. Anybody with the raised hand? Uh, Fiona, do you want to uh, to to take on the question that I read from the chat? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm not going to be daring enough to uh, to name any particular uh, scholar. I'm not sure where one would even start. I think there are obviously uh, scholars uh, who are making uh, significant contributions um, in various uh, fields, including those fields which uh, Tandika worked on. Um, so are we left in a vacuum? No, I would say certainly not. 
um, I think there is a flourishing um, of uh, different thought uh, within the continent, including from different uh, ideological perspectives, challenging uh, orthodoxies and so on. Um, but I'm not going to, as I said, be, be daring enough to, to name uh, any particular individual, uh, perhaps uh, yourself, uh, Godwin or, or Jimmy might want to do so. Uh, Jimmy, uh, do you think that the work that uh, we are continuing to canonize the interventions of Tandika uh, speak to uh, our ability to fill that vacuum that Tandika left? Well, you know, I mean, I actually, I, I, you know, one of the things we always say at Codexia is the need to avoid uh, uh, single shooting stars. Um, and I and I think what is what is uh, significant um, uh, about what we are doing today uh, uh, is is uh, is about valorizing. Uh, the, 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 the work of Tandika and, and, and using it to fertilize uh, a broader range of, of, uh, of uh, 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 intellectual uh, work by a variety of, of, of individuals at an intergenerational level. And, and the, the, the pool of people we have drawn, I mean, you know, Fiona, uh, I'm sure that from most people on this, uh, who attend this, uh, what do you call it, um, event, this is the fourth time they will have come across uh, uh, Fiona uh, and hear her speak. Um, and, 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 and this is a significant advancement of the work of, uh, you know, that we are share with Tandika that she's doing. Um, if you look at uh, what do you call it, uh, retinue of, of speakers coming panel uh, from Greek Chawa uh, to Ndongo to Eob to uh, uh, you know Gabriel to Aqua uh, and 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 many of the works that many of us you know are doing, it's about creating a broader you know more expansive uh, network of intellectuals and scholars who are animated by the same commitment to a more just world, to a, a, a better future for Africa. Uh, and, and, and whether in the field of democracy, whether in the field of just transition, whether in the field of social policy, uh, I mean, you know, two of the people who are joining us, one as an attend attendant and one as a speaker, uh, are the recent winners of the Tandawuri Memorial Prize, uh, which which uh, Apod and and Fiona's uh, chair, uh, um, you know, uh, have, have uh, hosted for uh, for the past uh, uh, two two years. Um, you, you know, uh, um, you know, Dr. Chukuma, uh, for instance, was the winner of the, the Junior Prize. Uh, Dr. Ayob uh, Debra Merriam is a winner of the Senior Prize for 2022. Um, and, and, and so, so, so rather than looking for uh, the, the next shooting star, you know, it, 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 what the most important thing is about how we valorize the work mm -hmm. of Tadika within a much broader network of intellectuals. And that's what gives it its firm business uh, for the future advancement of scholarship and policy relevant work. Uh, the type of the presentation that, that, that Fiona made today and the kind of things that we'll listen to later after the break. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Jimmy. I, I, I share some of your thoughts on, uh, on that point. Uh, the bigger the archive uh, that is inspired by Tadeka's work, I think the better for for all of us. Uh, so the vacuum is actually uh, not, not uh, an issue at the moment. Uh, Fiona, I'm not sure if you can access the Q&A. Uh, I, I, I can see quite a number of questions there. Uh, Ashraf Patel has a, 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 an interesting question on whether you can elaborate on the um, fourth industrial revolution hype 
uh, did you want to take on that question? Uh, and before you do that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Nimi uh, Hoffman. I can see you have a longish question, which I would like you to come on camera and, uh, and raise uh, in summary. So uh, they will enable your camera. But meantime, uh, if you want to please take on the question from Ashraf uh, Patel on the fourth industrial revolution hype. Um, sure, thank you. Um, I mean, I think there are uh, qualitative differences in the in the four IR um, from previous technological change. Um, so, although I, I guess Ashraf might be referring to some of the rhetorical hype, but I think there, there's a it's not just hype in, in the sense that there is significant changes with an exponential speed um, and a scope and irreversibility that wasn't uh, there before. Um, the reality, of course, is that um, in many African countries haven't yet run the gambit, um, at least in, in, in full of all previous uh, industrial revolutions. And of course, this is not in a, a teleological sense um, where one has to be completed before the others. Um, but technological advancement of the previous industrial revolutions has yet to permeate a, many, a number of African countries um, in, a, in a substantial way. I think the, the reality is that the further that one falls behind a technological frontier, uh, the more difficult it becomes uh, to catch up. So it's not something that uh, a country uh, can, or even a firm can kind of wait for and hope to catch up with later, because the longer that you leave it, uh, the more uh, difficult um, it becomes. Uh, there is the introduction of some for our technologies within some firms within the, uh, the continent. For me, it's not so much about the, the word or the term uh, for IR, but it's about technological progress being fundamental to economic progress. Um, and that you can't really reach sustained high rates of growth in a country without technological progress. And that's gonna mean different things in different contexts. It doesn't mean for every country uh, to, to be at, a, at the technological frontier, but at least to have some element um, of, of catching up. Because it's important for uh, productivity, for competitiveness, uh, for and, and, and so on. So it emphasizes the importance of, of innovation, technology intensity, and not only within manufacturing, but uh, across uh, across sectors. Um, Chairperson, would you like me to go to the other questions or uh, back to you? Uh, yes, I would. I would uh, like you to go to to the other questions. Uh, but uh, before you do that, uh, can can I can I ask Nimi to come on camera and? Uh, summarize her own question so that uh, as you take on her question, you also take uh, the others that have just come up. Nimi? Sure, thanks Godwin. Um, so I guess the question that I had uh, regarded kind of the role of external actors who have vested interests in African deindustrialization. And I was curious to know um, what is required to push back successfully against that. An example that I had in mind was uh, vaccine apartheid. So um, it, India and South Africa pushed very, very hard across the global south uh, to ensure that there was a TRIPS waiver to enable uh, manufacturing of, uh, of a vaccine for COVID. Um, this uh, was successfully blocked by countries in the global north. And just recently now, uh, the WHO has set up an mRNA hub in Cape Town, which has managed to reverse engineer the Moderna COVID vaccine and will share the know-how with 15 to 20 spokes in Africa, Latin America, and Eastern Europe, creating a network of scientists who collaborate to produce mRNA vaccines in low and middle income countries. It sounds exactly like the kind of industrialization you're speaking about, yet it's probably going to fail again. <laughs> Why? Because uh, Moderna and, and, and countries in the global north are pushing back extremely hard against this. So these are examples where there are clear vested interests in African deindustrialization. I'm curious what's required to push back against that successfully. Uh, Fiona, back to you. Mm, uh, thank you. Um, so without going into the specifics of the, 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 the case which you, you mentioned as, a, as important as it is, um, I mean, broadly, I would say, yes, there will always be those vested interests. And uh, despite all of the, the rhetoric in international organizations about uh, the importance of Africa and importance of development and so on, when it comes to the crunch um, in terms of access to technology, trade access and so on, uh, that support is not always there. Even if we look, for example, at uh, green industrialization and the, the kinds of uh, responsibilities that are lying on the continent uh, as with the rest of humanity for uh, 
um, mitigating climate change, which is a legacy from uh, the, the early industrializers, and we don't see the kind of transfers of uh, resources and so on that are needed for for the green transition here. So I think the the, the point is, is is well made by by Numi. Um, you know, I think having said all of that, there is policy space, and sometimes I think within domestic debates. Um, uh, there's almost a sense of disempowerment that no, because of trips or because of, we, we can't do this, we can't do that, uh, we, we can't do this because of WTO and so on. And in some cases, yes, it is valid and we need to contest those in, in international forum and try to change us. But in some cases, uh, it, it becomes almost like an excuse for lack of political will, um, even domestically. So I think, yes, there are constraints, but yes, there is also space. And if we look at what um, even other countries or developing countries around the world and as well as some on the continent are, are, are doing now, um, there is still space for, for industrial policy, for innovation policy, and so on. So for me, it's, it's really a two-pronged approach to international for contesting those rules that limit the space, um, because Africa has that right to development like anywhere else, um, whilst at the same time taking maximum advantage of the space which is there to do as, as, as much as possible. And there will always be those barriers, as well as domestic uh, interests and so on, uh, that uh, might not come out openly and say that they are opposed to industrialization, but uh, indirectly th through their actions. Um, so it's important again, to have that broad coalition of, of interests that can stand together against those. Uh, uh, Fiona, do you want to take on the question from Ibnold da Cruz? I hope I'm pronouncing the name properly. It's uh, Tandika also had a sensitivity for individuals and the role of leaders. What I find interesting in the pursuit of development is the mix between ideas and leaders. Are we seeing this leadership on the continent? One that is willing to take on risks in reshaping political economy. Finally, best off of your policy and advisory work, where do we see green shots of industrialization across the continent? Um, yeah, I think for me, I guess it's a, it's a dialectic between the conditions and the role of um, and the possibilities of individuals uh, within those. I think we, in many ways, beyond the, the era of the, the big man uh, who, who will change uh, the country, um, the, the possibilities of, uh, of uh, individuals uh, playing a transformative role, I think, are largely within the conditions within a country. But that's not to say that individuals don't matter. Um, and in the, the kinds of things of uh, development, industrialization, and so on, we can see in certain countries the impact um, of individuals in in making things actually happen. I, I see, for example, uh, Professor Occupy on this on this call, as, as as well as others. I think we, when we look around the continent, we can see cases where where there's a, a combination of a political will, good ideas, um, and the ability to actually implement those, it does bear uh, real fruit and you can literally see the results um, on the ground. Um, in, in terms of green shoots for, for industrialization across the continent, um, let me just touch on it briefly. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a something which would take more, more uh, discussion. Um, maybe first in terms of green industrialization, which is one of those which I didn't uh, have, have a chance to get to during the lecture. I think it presents a constraints. It also presents opportunities. So whether sort of, uh, growth areas, for example, in renewables, um, countries which are latecomers can have more opportunities there in some senses because they are not already captured um, by existing industrial powers. Um, having said that, the kind of capabilities that are needed to get into those uh, new growth areas largely depend on existing capabilities. So it's, it's not that if you don't have existing productive capabilities in manufacturing, you can just suddenly um, develop them overnight in, in, in a new area. Yes, there are possibilities for leapfrogging, but there's also that need for just slow and patient investment in, in learning and capabilities and uh, physical capital and so on that actually provides the basis for the sort of a, a agility and adaptability for getting into those new areas. I think regional value chains are of crucial importance and the AFCFTA actually opens up the possibilities for that. And what's important there is also some of the thinking uh, within the AFCFTA, which is not just kind of uh, bring down barriers and let it happen, but the need to take uh, intentional purpose of steps 
to actually actively build up uh, regional value chains um, so that more of the trade um, and uh, put, uh, consumption within the continent can be of what's actually uh, produced within the continent. I mean, I think broadly, it, it's really going to be country specific. So for um, countries that are uh, only at the, the nascent stages of industrialization and have very limited industrial base, they will be wanting to look into uh, to those areas of industry that have uh, fairly low uh, barriers to entry um, and opportunities for learning and upgrading. So for example, textiles, I think remains one of them in a way that clothing perhaps might not be uh, so strong anymore. Um, and even agro-processing. So where countries have agricultural strengths, it's a, it's a, it's a jump into agro-processing, but it's not an impossible leap. Um, so I think that, yeah, uh, those, those are perhaps some of the, the green shoots, um, but it's really going to vary by country. Thank you uh, very much. I'm going to uh, take two additional questions. All of them are, uh, are in the Q&A. Uh, the first one, and I would like you to combine your response to the two of them so that we can conclude on this much. Uh, the first one has to do with the Africa continental free trade area and it was what is the net benefit of the Africa continental free trade area in industrialization of African countries in a context where there is no comparative advantages in their economies and two where should industrialization start in agro industry mineral beneficiation or production let us say country like Malawi or Mozambique. So that is the first set. Uh, the second set, uh, which pivots more towards the, uh, I think uh, it was agrarian question uh, from Cheryl Lynn Selman. Uh, considering the call to a daring industrialization program, what place does land ownership and distribution have in such a framework? Can the role of subsidizing social provisioning and subsistence through broad-based access to land sit comfortably in and alongside a daring industrial program structured to ensure broad-based access to the economy? Uh, please, Fiona, combine those two questions and then we can conclude on this note. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of the first one around the, the AFCFTA, um, I think I've uh, partly touched on it in the, the previous answers. I won't uh, uh, repeat that. Um, the, the question is asking about uh, the net benefits in a country where there's no comparative advantage. So there are no economies with no comparative advantage. Every economy has comparative advantage because it's relative. I think for me, what's important is to take a dynamic perspective towards that. So no economy is going to uh, grow uh, rich just by doing what it's good at at a certain point in time. Um, yes, you can expand that and so on, but to really catch up and to develop, we've got to look ahead to what an economy can become competitive in um, over, uh, over time. Uh, sorry, um, sorry uh, my, uh, our colleagues with interpretation, our colleagues with interpretation, I think there is an overlap uh, interpretation, uh, there is an overlap. Oh, yes, now it's okay. Uh, Fiona, please, you can continue. Thank you. Um, so I think that the key industrial policy point there is for countries to target activities in which they can become competitive within, uh, let's say, a medium term period. Um, and aim at that in a dynamic sense and take the kind of industrial policy measures which are needed to invest in those um, upgrade and, and so on. So linking that with the, the AFCFTA, I think uh, comparing across uh, continents uh, across countries of the continent, um, some of them uh, have similarities in, the, in their production structures, which I think uh, in, in some cases historically has, has limited uh, trade possibilities, but there are also complementarities. And I think over time, the diversification across the continent has, has, has increased. And I think even where there are those complementarities, um, it can actually be the basis for, for uh, regional value changes across the continent. Um, so I think it's about identifying uh, where those happen in a, in a where there's possibility for those in a purposive way. So the key thing is not just uh, wait for it to happen because it won't happen, but actually identifying what are the constraints on those, whether it be in auto, in uh, pharmaceuticals, and, 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 and so on, 
clothing and textiles, and actually trying to build those up. And it entails an approach that is not only at the country level, but even extends uh, to, to the firm level. Um, let me take the, the last question um, on uh, land ownership and uh, distribution. So the redistribution of uh, land uh, did play an important role, for example, in uh, unlocking uh, East Asian uh, industrialization. Um, and one can see you know, the, the importance of, of land for, for development and obviously to, to start a factory, you need a land to place it on and so on. Let me be a little bit controversial though to say that for me, I don't think, I don't see access to land as the fundamental constraint on industrialization in Africa. Um, access to land, I think, can be important for, for, for other reasons. And I'm not saying it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all for industrialization. Um, and there are various other uh, reasons and some of them are country specific, such as here in South Africa, uh, where uh, land matters. Um, but I don't think it's the, it's the binding constraint on uh, industrialization. Um, yeah, so let me, let me maybe leave it uh, there on, on that question. Uh, no, thank you very much. I... I, I have a I have a message in my chat about uh, uh, Tolika uh, who had raised up the hand, but I didn't see that. Is, 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 are you still keen on asking a final question, Tolika? For some reason, I I did not see that hand raised. Okay, um, my apologies for not seeing that, but uh, I think that uh, uh, we, we have explored uh, a good set of questions that uh, give uh, life to the presentation that Fiona uh, made. And uh, uh, you will have noticed that I transitioned from the more formal professor Fiona Tregena to Fiona, which uh, uh, was my way of borrowing from the uh, uh, the tradition that Tandika uh, did leave us. Uh, I want to bring this session to a conclusion uh, and to extend our gratitude. Uh, and by our, I mean Unrist, uh, Kodesria, and the such chair uh, in social policy. Uh, we want to extend our deep appreciation uh, to you, Professor Fiona Trigena, for this extremely illuminating lecture. Uh, that has not only raised uh, important questions, but actually done justice uh, to the work of uh, the late Tandika Mkanda uh, uh, in, in, in his uh, uh, intellectual uh, journey. Uh, we uh, normally do publish uh, the Tandika Mkanda Memorial Lecture. Uh, we started this uh, last year. Uh, the immediate, um, uh, the first lecture, a memorial lecture has been published in Africa Development, uh, volume 47, number two. And uh, Fiona, we're looking forward to publishing yours as the second uh, in a series of lectures that we'll be publishing, uh, but also developing an archive in, in honor of Tandika uh, on this. So we really want to thank you very much and appreciate uh, the energy, time, and skill that you put into this uh, particular lecture. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you again uh, for the invitation. Uh, I, I will now uh, hand over to Professor Jimmy Adesina uh, to provide uh, direction on uh, both timing for the uh, break and uh, what happens after that. Uh, okay, all right, thank you very much. Um, we, we thought we should allow for about 30 minutes break uh, for people to, you know, get water, food, drink, and so on and so forth. Uh, the idea is to start at uh, 10.30, uh, you know, 12.30 uh, UTC or 2.30 uh, um, uh, Central African time, which is standard uh, for the South African standard time. Uh, so we will break now. You can leave your screen on. There'll be a timer, you know, there'll be, you know, counting down. And at two, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 2 30 Central African time, uh, we will pivot uh, to the uh, roundtable panel discussion. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. See you in 30 minutes.
Hi, Karina. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Jimmy, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good, good. I can hear you. <laughs> good, yeah. good to see you. I've been following, but I, I wasn't quite sure how it, this worked on my mobile phone because I've used oh, a okay. laptop usually for this. So <laughs> okay. I, had to, okay. I had to go out and yes. so I've had you in my ear. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank it's you all for well. That. Thank you for joining us. I think it's oh, gone on. Thank you so well. much for inviting me. It's it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. I just came back from London the other day. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I I joined I joined remotely. Mm. As I'm still waiting for my new passport, you know. <laughs> so oh, yes. 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 I yeah. couldn't travel. Oh, that was such a shame. Yes. Yeah. No, but it was okay. It's okay. Yeah, you could. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, one can follow remotely like this. It's good. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, uh, it was a, it was a good, it was a nice event. Yeah. At LSE, yes. 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 It was my first time back to London. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Anyway, yeah. So. Bon continuation, and we'll yeah, keep in touch, Jimmy. Yeah, okay. Okay, Merci. all the all best. Right. Yeah, okay. good, Thanks. good. Bye, bye. Uh, oh yeah, Kino uh, uh, Okay, I can't, I can't pull out the the document. But what I really want to do is that I want to.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the second segment uh, of today's annual memorial lecture event in honor of Tandikam Kandawiri. Uh, Dr. Kaja Hujo will chair today's roundtable panel discussion. Kaja is the senior research coordinator in the Transformative Social Policy Program of UNRISD and a member of the Institute's senior management group. Kaja's academic work focuses on social policy, poverty, inequality, socioeconomic development and sustainability transition. Much of her research is at the interface of economics and politics, covering, for example, the political economy of pension reform, social protection and poverty reduction, social policy in mineral rich context, the politics of domestic resource mobilization for social development, and more recently on the political drivers of inequality. Before joining UNRISD in 2006, Kaja was a research fellow and lecturer at Latin American Institute at Free University Berlin. She studied economics and political science at Ebert Hall University, Tivogen, a free state, free, free University Berlin, and the National University of Cordoba, Argentina, and holds a doctoral uh, degree in economics from uh, Free University. Uh, in 2004, she was visiting fellow at CIE PP Buenos Aires. Uh, over to you, Kaja. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for the kind uh, introduction and welcome everybody to the second part of this very important event uh, celebrating the life and work of Tandika Makandawiri. It's, it's a great pleasure um, also for myself uh, to be part of this event and my thanks to, to the uh, Sachi Chair of Social Policy at the University uh, of South Africa and Kodesria, Godwin Morunga, and all those who support uh, and have endorsed this event in the first part um, this morning. Um, we had a very inspiring memorial lecture by Professor Fiona Tregena and a lively discussion. And I have now the pleasure to introduce you to five outstanding scholars whose research is inspired by and contributes to the legacy of Tendika's work and the questions he had raised. The panel has a particular focus on the prospects for a developmental state in Africa, which is the key topic of today's event. And of course, a particular focus of Tendika's work. After having heard about the prospects for catching up and industrialization, from Professor Tregena. During this panel, we will hear more about agriculture as well as green energy, um, in, in addition to discussions about the prospects for a developmental state. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the presentations uh, that are coming. Um, just to say that the occasion of celebrating Tandika's work and legacy and how, how we actually nurture, as Jimmy said, this growing network of scholars who are inspired by his ideas and who follow in his footsteps in terms of creating these integrated, interdisciplinary and historically in context grounded analysis of development problems and of development challenges across the world, but in particular for Africa, um, it's really something um, that is very important in my own work. And I join Fiona in saying that these events are a great occasion to revisit his writings and to really delve into his articles and chapters and books. And it is a very inspiring journey. Uh, every time I do that, I learn a lot and um, I'm glad that he was a director and mentor um, of the work we are doing uh, at UNRIST. So in order to not cut further into time, by reading out the detailed bias 
of our eminent speakers, I would like to refer you to their um, uh, to the information that you can find in the program. I would also like to encourage you when you listen to the presentations that you already note down your questions or directly put them into the uh, Q&A box you find at the bottom of the screen. We will have time for discussion after the presentations. So I have now the honor to invite our first speaker, Dr. Grieve Chava from the New School in New York, talking about the impossibility argument and the developmental state in 21st century Africa. Dr. Chava, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kaja Hujo. It's, uh, it's an honor to meet you, and I look forward to meeting you one day in person. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, fraternal greetings from, <clears throat> from New York City, where it is 8.14 in the morning. Uh, I'm ordinarily in Lusaka, Zambia, but I uh, work for the new school in New York City, and I often travel uh, back and forth. Uh, so this particular day has caught me in New York City. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the South African Research Chair Initiative in Social Policy, uh, the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, and the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development for this kind invitation to participate in today's remembrance of one of Africa's and indeed the world's greatest economist and social scientist, Professor Tandikam Kandawire. I'm incredibly humbled by this invitation. Uh, this event will certainly live in my memory for many, many years to come. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Mkandawire's family for first and foremost sharing him with us and allowing us to remember Prof, as I will call him in this way, as we are doing today. Thank you so much to the family. Um, a special thank you to uh, Professor Jimmy Adeshina, uh, who is a Saatchi Chair in Social Policy for the hard work and very clear, detailed, but relaxing way he has communicated with us, the panelists, uh, in the run up to today's event. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Professor Fiona Tregena for delivering a masterful lecture, uh, certainly befitting the, mem the memory of our Mwalimu Tandikam Kandawire. Um, the inspiration for my panel presentation uh, today is Professor Mkandawire's timeless 2001 article, Thinking About Development, Developmental States in Africa, which appeared in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. It has already been mentioned uh, uh, already in this, in this particular event. Um, this is his most cited publication with 1,257 citations as of this morning. Um, this number certainly does not include the many people who have informally cited this paper in their efforts to make sense of the African situation and how to bring about positive change. Uh, for example, I was once at a workshop on debt held by civil society organizations in Nairobi in 2019 and was amazed by the extent to which thinking about developmental states was referenced in that day's deliberations. And as you can imagine, this is really impact because this is our colleagues in civil society who one may say deal with practical things, but in that day's deliberations, thinking about developmental states was really used as a framing uh, resource material to guide that day's discussions. As anyone who has closely studied Professor Mkandawire's work, uh, anyone who has uh, closely studied Professor Mkandawire's work can attest that it is almost an exercise in futility to pick a favorite of his work because all of it is just good, all of it is just brilliant. But thinking about developmental states is really up there for me and is prof at his finest, not least because of the play with words that he demonstrated in that article. Few economists, if at all any, can claim to write the way prof wrote in that article uh, and certainly many others of his work. <clears throat> Here's an example of just magnificent writing uh, taken from the intro of that, of that paper. You, you'll forgive me as I, it, it's, it's quite, of an, quite an extensive quote. One remarkable feature of the discourse on the state and development in Africa 
is the disjuncture between an analytical tradition that insists on the impossibility of developmental states in Africa and a prescriptive literature that presupposes the possibility of their presence. That's just beautiful. States whose capacity to pursue any project is denied at one level are exalted at a prescriptive level to assume roles that are beyond their capacity, character, or political will. Such states are urged to delink, to reduce themselves, to stabilize the economy, to privatize the economy, to engage in good governance, to democratize themselves and society, to create an enabling environment for the private sector, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, to do that which they cannot do. That's the opening uh, uh, sentence, some sentences from the intro of that remarkable article, just really demonstrating the dexterity with which Prof used language, um, but to devastating effect. In thinking about developmental states, Prof Mkandawire made so many contributions, one of which was to provide a realistic definition of a developmental state. And here his definition was as follows. A developmental state is one whose ideological underpinnings are developmental and one that seriously attempts to, de to deploy its administrative and political resources to the task of economic development. A developmental state is one whose ideological underpinnings are developmental and one that seriously attempts to deploy its administrative and political resources to, to the task of economic development. Uh, Prof placed the word attempt in italics to stress the trial and error characteristics of the development process, or what Deng Xiaoping characterized as crossing the stream whilst feeling for, for the pebbles. In this way, failed attempts at development were not sufficient to dis disqualify one from being thought of as a developmental state. And for Prof, economic development itself is a result of high rates of accumulation and structural change in the direction of industrialization, as Professor Fiona so eloquently, eloquently demonstrated earlier today. A second contribution of the paper was to confront the so-called impossibility argument for developmental states in Africa, an argument that was so forcefully made by the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera the IMF and the World Bank, but also made by many other analysts, some of whom could be considered progressive and even allies of the continent. The impossibility argument acknowledges the primacy of developmental states for economic development, as certainly happened in the Asian case, but argues that such states are impossible in the African case for a host of reasons. The genius of Professor Mkandawira in this article was to one, assemble a typology of the arguments that constituted the impossibility argument, and two, to show that these arguments were false and thus making the case for not only the necessity, but the possibility of developmental states in Africa. What I'd like to do is to revisit that typology that Prof assembled in thinking about developmental states to see how the impossibility argument fares in this, the third decade of the 21st century. In other words, was the impossibility argument permanently slain in 2001 or have events since then begun to turn in its favor? Uh, that is the question I'd like to explore uh, in this talk. By way of the refresher, the following typology of impossibility arguments was assembled in that blockbuster article from 2001. The first one was a lack of ideology. The second one was lack of technical, analytical, and administrative capacity. The third one was neo-patrimonialism. The fourth one was a public choice and rent-seeking arguments. And the, 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 the last one, the fifth one was an absence of good economic performance. Basically, these sets of arguments were marshaled by those who, who argued for the impossibility of a developmental state uh, in Africa. Right? I'd like to pay attention to the first, lack of ideology. Second, lack of technical, analytical, and administrative capacity. And the, la and the fifth one, the last one, absence of good economic performance um, uh, to sort of uh, try to see essentially how the impossibility argument fares today. And I'm focusing on these three precisely because the neo-patrimonialism uh, argument and the public choice rent-seeking arguments have, in my humble opinion, been, been so devastatingly debunked that no serious scholar of African development can ever raise them again. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Prof, 
in a, in, in a relatively recent article, I think uh, dealt a fatal blow to neo-patrimonialism and the public choice rent seeking arguments. And uh, the article for those who are interested uh, came out in 2015 in World Politics and it's called Neo-Patrimonialism and the Political Economy of Economic Performance in Africa, Critical Reflections. Okay, so the question is, how is impossibility argument faring in the third decade of the 21st century? In answering this question, I'll work my way backwards by starting with the, uh, with the argument on the absence of good economic performance and work my way uh, 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 towards capacity as well as lack of ideology. Uh, the basic argument here is that the developmental states are not possible in Africa because the continent has always been a growth tragedy. Who here can forget uh, William Easterly's and uh, Ross Levin's 1997 article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which was simply titled Africa's Growth Tragedy. Prof showed that up to 2001, Africa's growth record, both in space and time, was so varied, making the growth tragedy thesis, thesis untrue. What about the 21st century? What can be said about Africa's growth record? <clears throat> Again, much like Prof ascertained in his paper, the African growth record in the 21st century is varied across space and time. That is to say, some countries have respectively grown at certain periods of time, while others have not, and some countries have grown at certain uh, uh, at certain points in time and not grown and not grown at others. So really, the growth record much like Prof, Prof had, uh, had concluded up to 2001, is also varied uh, in the 21st century. A classic example is my own country, Zambia, which grew on average by some 7% per annum in the decade 2000 to 2009, and then subsequently grew much slower at about 2% per annum in the decade 2010 to 2019. This pattern was very much replicated across much of the African continent, and is encapsulated in, for example, the Economist newspaper's coverage of the growth record on the continent uh, in the 21st century, where they moved from a cover story in 2001 that encapsulated or that announced Africa rising to more pessimistic stories in the second decade of the 21st century. As with the period studied by Prof, economic performance in Africa is varied across space and time and is largely driven by the external environment especially dynamics in the commodities markets and especially most poignantly demonstrated by the COVID pandemic and unfortunate war that's currently, currently raging in Ukraine. What about uh, the other uh, uh, set, set of argument um, in favor of the impossibility argument? So the other argument against, uh, the other sets of arguments against the developmental state, which is sort of a lack of technical, technical, analytical and administrative capacity. The argument here is that the developmental states are impossible in Africa because African states lack the technical, analytical, and administrative capacity to carry out its role. One of the most condescending statements of this argument was contained in Lewis and Stein's 1997 article in World Development, uh, uh, who, who wrote, the extensive coordinated economic interventions of the developmental East Asian states are well beyond the administrative faculties of most African governments. I read that again because it is such a shocking statement that it appeared in scholarship and published scholarship. The extensive coordinated economic interventions of the developmental East Asian states are well beyond the administrative faculties of most African governments. Is there anything to be said about a technical, analytical, and administrative capacity in Africa in the 21st century? The answer is certainly yes. The continent has faced and continues to face many crises in the 21st century, and one is struck by the dexterity with which many of these crises have been confronted and in some non-trivial instances overcome and working with very limited and stretched resources. I'd like to mention here a few examples, leaning heavily again on the Zambian case, which I believe is not an atypical case. For example, infrastructure. At a time of Prof's writing in 2001, the continent was in the throes of an infrastructural backlog whose origins lay in the crisis of the 1980s and the prescriptions that came out of it. We all know that the infrastructure backlog that was ravaging at the time Prof was writing was very much again instigated by the Bretton Woods institutions as, uh, as they made the argument that, you know, uh, government should, the state should roll back even from providing infrastructure. But since Prof's writing, many parts of the continent have begun to impressively close the infrastructure backlog by initiating and completing many complex infrastructure construction projects. 
A classic example, example here is a 750 megawatts Kafir Gorge power station in Zambia, Kafir Gorge lower power station in Zambia, whose construction was, was planned many years, many decades ago, but was initiated in 2015 in response to a crippling power deficit that was then afflicting the country. <coughs> the project was completed on, on schedule and has made the country largely energy sufficient and in some instances a net exporter of power. Examples also abound from other parts of the continent. Obviously, this has been uh, helped along by the role of China that has provided a relatively affordable project finance, but still one cannot discount the role of uh, the African bureaucracy, the African state in seeing through um, uh, some of these projects. In many cases, some of these projects also require counterparty funding on the part of the African state, as is illustrated with the Kafir Gorge Lower project. Um, I'd also like to quickly talk about the farmer input support program in Zambia, which turned Zambia into a maize deficit country in much of the 1990s to a maize surplus country in the 21st century. <laughs> I beg your pardon, my, um, I have a cold. I'd like to talk about the farmer input support program, which turned Zambia into a maize deficit country, uh, which turns Zambia into a maize, um, farmers, which turns Zambia into a maize, uh, into a, it turns Zambia from a deficit country in much of the 1990s to a maize surplus country in the 21st century, a program that required a vast mobilization of human and financial resources to carry out. <laughs> also like to talk about the handling of the COVID pandemic and the delicate balancing of lockdowns versus allowing for economic activity to go on. Many African governments deploy track, trace, and isolation methods well before countries in the West knew what was going on. Many African states did this so well to the bafflement of colleagues in the West that there's now a veritable industry of research papers to find the dead that the Africans, the, the dead that Africans are hiding from COVID, right? So the African state has a technical, analytical, and administrative capacity required for a developmental state, even in the 21st century. But what we continue to see are recommendations again from the Bretton Woods institutions uh, to undermine such capacity as happened during structural adjustment and continues to happen even today, right? In the Zambian case, uh, Zambia is on back on an IMF program and one sees in that program uh, pretty much uh, a policy advice that's predicated on rolling back the African state, uh, the Zambian state. And I'd like to talk about the last uh, uh, set of argument uh, that was adduced to say uh, you could not have a developmental state in Africa. And this is a lack of a developmentalist ideology. The argument here is that a developmental state requires an ideology of development anchored in some sort of a nationalist project. And the absence of such an ideology in Africa has precluded the emergence of a developmental state. Prof Mkandawira in his article showed that post-colonial states, uh, that the post-colonial states he studied up to 2001 were identified by having a very strong developmentalist ideology as memorably articulated by some of the first generation post-independence leaders, right? I think uh, another one of Prof's very famous um, articles which Prof Fiona um, certainly referenced and uses in her title is uh, borrowing from uh, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere's African, uh, Africa must run while others walk. That was essentially an articulation of this developmentalist ideology. Sadly, this is the one aspect where it seems that the tide has swung, hopefully not too far in the direction of the impossibility argument. Today, one is hard pressed to find an African state or even African heads of state that articulate a coherent and cogent developmentalist ideology anchored in a nationalist project. To be sure, many states promulgate national development plans every so often, but these are done mostly as checkbook exercise, exercises or as preconditions for the receipt of aid in one form or the other. Not to mention the content that shies away from statist aspirations. These documents do not and have not become the documents that mobilize and focus the energies and imagination of the state to pursue transformative development. Again, this state of affairs is not without an explanation. Most states in Africa are dominated by ministries of finance and central banks, which are in turn led by <laughs> Most states in Africa are dominated by ministries of finance and central banks, which are in turn led by economists who have been trained not in development planning or long-term planning or develop or sort of 
thinking about the processes and structures of development, but in anti-status macroeconomic stability, which came into vogue at the behest of the Bretton Woods institutions in the 1980s. Uh, many ministers of finance today and central bank governors have had ex extended stints in the Bretton Woods institutions, and you can name them uh, the current um, uh, Minister of Finance in Zimbabwe uh, has had a stint uh, in, a, in, 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 in an IFI. Uh, the current Minister of Finance in Zambia has had a stint in an IFI. The current Central Bank Governor in Zambia has had an instant, a stint in, a, in an IFI, Bretton Woods Institution type organization. The current Governor of, um, of uh, the Central Bank in Kenya has also had such a stint. So we have a situation where many of our Ministers of Finance and central bank governors were well, are really trained in macroeconomic stability and not so much in thinking about or at least are socialized in macroeconomic stability concerns and not so much so sort of concerns about the processes of long-term development uh, and surprisingly prof wrote about this phenomenon he wrote about many things but he also wrote about this phenomenon and surprisingly in a 2014 article in african studies review called the spread of economic doctrines and policy making in post-colonial africa where he carefully documented the ideological under, underpinnings of different generations of African economists since independence. And he was able to show and trace that many of the folks running uh, the economies in our countries really were trained in the 80s at a time in which the vogue was macroeconomic stability. So to conclude, the impossibility argument is not faring so well in the third decade of the 21st century, as, have I, as I have articulated. Um, many of the arguments in its favor still do not hold water. Uh, but worryingly, and perhaps in its favor, is that the 21st century African state is not as developmentalist in its orientation as its predecessors, right? And part of this is really a, a, a sort of a long-term effect of the structure adjustment process, uh, which means that there's much work to be done for those of us who are beneficiaries of Prof. Kandawiri's scholarship and begin to think deeply about how do we get our states to to adopt, or at least how do we get those who run our economies to adopt this developmentalist ideology? We need to study this. I think this is a challenge that is uh, that Prof, Prof scholarship has given to my generation to really think quite deeply about this impossibility argument, especially narrowing in on this issue of ideology. Why is it that our states are not developmentalist in orientation? What has gone wrong, right? So studying really that, uh, that process. Um, Colleagues, this is uh, the remarks I wanted to share with you this morning. I apologize for the incessant coughing, but I picked up a cold here in New York City where the weather is changing for the worse. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Grieve Chalva, for this inspiring talk. Um, you have taken one particular famous article from Professor Makandawiri. You have shown that at present times, uh, we are still confident to refute the arguments that were made 20 years ago uh, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, Tandika's critique, but which go actually back to a much longer history of uh, not trusting in the developmental capacity of African states. And as you have shown, um, the recent decades have shown uh, quite impressive, though varied, growth rates uh, across the continent. It has shown uh, the dedication and resolve of many governments in catching up with infrastructure development, but also with administering social policies and a very uh, powerful and effective um, pandemic response as well. And finally, um, also a call for attention actually to what structural adjustment has done in terms of shrinking policy space, delegitimizing um, state institutions, and uh, switching to this uh, technocratic policy making that has actually undermined state capacity in terms of developing a very comprehensive developmental ideology and vision. And I think that ties in very nicely with uh, what Professor Fayona has, has also mentioned in terms of that developmental strategies and industrialization require a, a vision in the long durée and require really uh, just going beyond immediate stabilization or market-oriented reforms. So thank you very much for this.
And I'm sure there will be a lot of questions also coming from, from our audience. Let me now uh, uh, move on to our next speaker, Professor Akua Opokua Britworm from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. And she will talk about agriculture and Africa's development planning. So again, very nicely picking up one of the key uh, concerns that were raised uh, by uh, Dr. Greeley. Please, Professor Akua, would you take the floor? I'm not sure whether we have lost her because I can't see her on the screen. No, you are there. We can't hear you. Maybe you are still muted. We still can't hear you. Okay, Professor Akua suggests we move on to the next speaker first and so she can sort out the technical problems. That is no problem at all. And so, so let me then introduce our next two speakers, uh, Dr. Ndongo Sambasila from Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Senegal, uh, together with Professor Daniela Gabor, University of West England, Bristol, UK. They will talk about dreams of green hydrogen. Please take the floor. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here among all of you uh, for this uh, great event to celebrate one of our greatest uh, thinkers and also uh, Pan-Africanist. Uh, uh, as I'm one of the <laughs> only uh, Francophone here, I will speak to, 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 to French so that probably I will be a creator in the presentation. Uh, donc, Daniela Gabor et moi sommes très heureux d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui uh, ici pour célébrer uh, ce grand économiste que fut uh, uh, Tandika uh, Mokanda Wire. Et donc, notre communication uh, porte sur, uh, uh, en fait, uh, ça s'appelle Dreams of Green Hydrogen, ça s'appelle le rêve d'hydrogène vert. Et donc, ce qu'il faut dire dès l'entame, c'est que Daniela et moi, et moi avons commencé à collaborer euh, depuis quelques temps par rapport euh, à la question même qui fait l'objet de cette conférence, c'est-à-dire la possibilité euh, au 21e siècle euh, d'un état développementiste. Et donc, euh, dans la conjoncture particulière dans laquelle on est, L'état développementiste euh, doit nécessairement être un état, disons, euh, qui prend en compte les contraintes environnementales. Donc, euh, Green Developmental State. Euh, et il se trouve que euh, nous avons un peu basculé de paradigme, c'est-à-dire qu'à un moment donné, on était dans le paradigme euh, euh, bien décrit par Tandika Mukandaviré, le Washington Consensus, les politiques néolibérales, que Tandika a bien décrit et qui ont d'une certaine manière affaibli les capacités, euh, disons, des, des États africains. Et donc, on est passé à un nouveau paradigme, euh, disons, qui s'appelle le Wall Street Consensus. Et ce nom a été trouvé et choisi par Daniela Gabor, qui correspond à un nouvel environnement, disons, des politiques de développement et aussi à une nouvelle idéologie des politiques de développement qui donne la part belle 
disons, au capital financier global. Euh, et donc, ce nouvel environnement crée des contraintes nouvelles pour les, pour les États et il est bien, en fait, de pouvoir euh, avoir une idée euh, de ces, de ces contraintes-là. Surtout à l'heure actuelle où on fait face à de nombreuses crises euh, alimentées, notamment au départ par la pandémie, euh, la guerre euh, de la Russie en Ukraine, et tout ce que ça entraîne, notamment l'inflation mondiale et aussi le resserrement des conditions de crédit global. Et donc tout ça euh, crée une situation qui n'est pas favorable pour les pays du Sud, notamment les pays africains. Euh, mais tout ça également crée euh, des opportunités parce que partout où il y a des crises, il peut y avoir des opportunités pour avoir des politiques différentes. Et euh, il faut dire qu'il y a 40 ans, quand il y a eu, en tout cas au début des années 80, les politiques d'ajustement structurel, on avait un chercheur africain, un historien, qui avait une utopie euh, industrielle panafricaniste euh, qui s'appelait Cher, Cher Antadjob. Et donc, euh, à l'époque euh, où les pays africains étaient soumis à ces politiques, euh, disons, d'ajustement structurel, euh, critiquées à juste raison par Tandika Makandewire, on avait eu une vision très intéressante, prophétique même, de, de Cher Antadjob sur euh, le rôle important que l'hydrogène vert allait jouer on pourrait jouer dans le développement du continent euh, africain. Et donc, euh, je, avec votre autorisation, je vais euh, partager un peu euh, les slides que nous avons préparés. Euh, voilà, je ne sais pas si vous voyez mon écran. Yeah, all good. Oui, okay. oui, oui. You, you see my screen? OK, so it's fine. OK. Et donc... Euh, um, OK. Donc, Cher Antediop avait une utopie énergétique. Euh, il parlait, en fait, de l'importance que l'hydrogène allait euh, occuper, euh, disons, dans le monde, en tout cas, actuel, le 21e siècle. Euh, et donc, parce qu'il se rendait compte qu'à un moment donné, les préoccupations environnementales allaient euh, ressurgir et qu'il faudrait nécessairement en fait, baser euh, l'industrialisation sur des énergies propres. Et donc, euh, il y a un texte qu'il avait présenté en 1985 qui s'appelle euh, « Problème énergétique, énergétique africain » où il faisait, on peut dire, cette prophétie, cette prophétie également qui a valeur d'utopie. Et donc, il disait qu'avec euh, l'hydrogène vert, en fait, euh, un avion n'aurait qu'à, en fait, aurait, aurait une empreinte, disons, carbone très limitée euh, par rapport aux énergies euh, fossiles qu'on utilise également. Et donc, il disait qu'en fait, euh, qu'avec l'hydrogène vert, euh, il y aurait beaucoup plus de possibilités de, de, de développement pour les pays africains. Et dans ce cadre également, il appelait les États africains, justement, à se coordonner pour mettre en place les infrastructures, euh, les politiques qu'il faut pour profiter de, cette, euh, de ce potentiel de l'hydrogène vert. Et c'est là où vous pouvez lire en fait, une citation issue de ce texte où il disait que, imaginons qu'en cinq ans, les gouvernements africains mettent en place euh, voilà, des unités euh, solaires quelque part près de la mer qui produiraient des énergies renouvelables qui permettraient en fait, à, à partir de l'eau de mer, euh, disons, de séparer l'eau de mer en fait en hydrogène et en oxygène et cet hydrogène pourrait être liquéfié, euh, stocké, transporté et transformé en d'autres euh, produits et ceci pourrait être disons une base pour le développement de l'Afrique, c'est-à-dire que l'Afrique n'aurait pas à exporter l'hydrogène euh, comme, euh, comme euh, produit primaire mais comme euh, technologie au, au reste du monde et donc cette vision technologique elle est aujourd'hui possible pourquoi Parce que de plus en plus, on voit qu'il y a des compagnies euh, transnationales qui euh, misent sur l'hydrogène vert. On voit aussi qu'il y a cette poussée vers l'hydrogène euh, dans les pays européens et même aussi au niveau des euh, institutions financières euh, internationales. Donc, cette vision technologique, elle est là. Mais est-ce qu'on a l'état euh, développement test qu'appelait de ses votes euh, Tanika Makandewere pour que cette vision euh, technologique euh, se matérialise et soit bénéfique aux, aux Africains? Donc, je vais passer la parole à, à Daniela Gabor pour qu'elle élabore un peu plus par rapport à ça. So, Daniela, you have the floor. 
Thank you. Um, well, thank you to the organizers and uh, to confuse everybody. We've decided to do this bilingually because I cannot follow and don't go in with his, in his impeccable French. Um, so um, we thought we would also show you, um, don't go, if you stop sharing your screen, I might try to share mine okay. while we allow our audience to think through questions of green hydrogen. Um, Okay, so can you see this now? Yeah, if put your, your yeah, yeah yes. okay, thank you. Okay, so we just thought we'd show you the kind of standard uh, pictures that you will find in uh, the projects to, to create green hydrogen uh, plants across uh, African countries. We have focused uh, in, a, in a piece that will uh, soon be out in the Boston Review that uh, Ndongo and I have co-authored. We have focused on Namibia because in Namibia, we can ask some very interesting questions about the resurgence of uh, the developmental state in, in, a, in a green sort of form. Questions that uh, uh, are interesting in parallel to uh, Tandika Makanda Wire's uh, vision of what a developmental state would look like. And uh, when uh, countries um, and, and private companies think about green hydrogen projects, the logic of green hydrogen, if you, if you allow me to, I'm not a green hydrogen ex expert, but both of us have learned quite a lot uh, about it in the last uh, five months. The idea is, and this is in, on your right hand side, you will see an illustration from Namibia's uh, green hydrogen plan of, uh, called Hyphen, which is a partnership between uh, the Namibian government, a German uh, renewable energy company, and the private equity company. So the standard kind of partnership that we have described uh, in the Wall Street consensus logic of creating partnerships around investable projects. And this is what uh, this Hyphen uh, vision for uh, Namibia looks like for the green hydrogen um, uh, 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 project in Namibia, and it's not just one, there are several. The idea is that uh, any country that is close to the sea and that has solar and wind power could become a, a force and an exporter of green hydrogen. There is a global rush to, to green hydrogen because of the European Union, in particular, the European Union push to uh, accelerate the transition to low carbon, a push that has been now even further accelerated by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the logic is that a lot of industries, particularly in Germany, but not only, a lot of industries that uh, cannot, that have to uh, become um, or less carbon intensive or to well, move away from fossil fuels can do so by using either green hydrogen or in this case, uh, green ammonia. Uh, so the, uh, the, the projections for the, the global rush to green hydrogen are, are quite eye-watering. There, there are estimates that a quarter of global energy uh, um, needs of, uh, over 2030 to 2050 will be supplied by green hydrogen. And the, then the logic is how can we jump on the, on the how can we become uh, commodity exporters? How can we export green hydrogen uh, commodities? Uh, and are we, do we have the, let's say, comparative advantage to do so? And the logic is very simple in the, I mean, the process is complicated. The green hydrogen is a very capital intensive technology, which already uh, raises some interesting questions around the, de the developmental state. But the logic is you take uh, uh, seawater, you put it into a desal desalinization plant, so you get uh, regular water. Then that water goes through an uh, electrolyzer in a, in a plant. Um, where uh, it is split between hydro in hydrogen and uh, oxygen. And it is green hydrogen because the energy that is used to split the uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen is produced by uh, renewable means, by wind and, uh, and solar plants. And if you see here in, in, the, in the picture, and that's, I think, the important thing to take away, what we see from uh, in Namibia's uh, pro uh, uh, project is not just a, uh, a project to become a commodity ex green uh, hydrogen commodity exporter, but also to benefit the local economy and to create some form of green industrialization zones out of, uh, out of the green hydrogen project. Not only because um, uh, typically green hydrogen projects and hyphen is, is very big, it's $10 billion, it's, it's as big as uh, the entire output of the Namibian economy in, in one year, 
so it, it doesn't just produce green uh, hydrogen and green ammonium, uh, a, derivat uh, a derivative that can be easily transported. It also generates enough grid capacity and enough renewable energy from the project to then supply to uh, the local economy and hopefully generate cheap electricity for uh, various uh, energy projects. So what we've done with Ndongo is to look through uh, the actual plans and to ask ourselves, are we seeing here the, the green shots of a, of a uh, resurgence of uh, Makandawida's dream and uh, Diop's dream of a green developmental state in, uh, in the green hydrogen opportunity. And what we do see is first, no, it's not just Namibia, and I just want to make that clear. There is an African Green Hydrogen Alliance composed by uh, of several countries. South Africa is very interesting uh, in that story, but I, I don't know enough and I don't have time to look into it. I can tell you a bit more about Namibia. So there is a, a Green Hydrogen Alliance on the African continent. There are green hydrogen projects all around countries in middle income and low income countries powered in part by partnerships with uh, countries in the global north, Germany, in, in, in Namibia's case, Germany and uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. And the logic here, and when the, the, the first sort of interesting point to, to see is that there is a, a logic of industrialization, what Tandika Mukandarwira used to call industrialization by invitation, which is the Namibian government is not planning in the first stages of the green hydrogen economy to, to, get, to work with local uh, capital, with local capitalists as it were, uh, that the previous speakers referred to, but is basically working with a, Global North companies and with private, with uh, global investors in these de-risking partnerships that I've been uh, researching. And the idea is, you know, uh, while Namib Namibia, the Namibian government will will uh, basically contribute or uh, have a, uh, a minority equity stake in the project, but it is the combination of a, re a German renewable energy company and a global investor that will basically uh, put this in place. Um, and uh, we, what we ask, and, and I will let Ndongo uh, elaborate that in, in further detail, is can we see here a revival, so overcoming what uh, uh, Dr. Chel Chelwa called the, the impossibility um, argument, are we seeing at least a Namibian state going beyond the impossibility argument and trying to articulate a vision of uh, in green industrial development that works and where industrialization by invitation, creating an enabling environment that attracts foreign capital, particularly financial capital, can that work to, uh, to generate the, a developmental project as uh, Tandika Mkandawira envisaged? So Nondongo, back to you. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Probably you could switch to the next slide. Okay. Yeah, with, with, with Tandika, yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry, I, I, was, I meant to, to okay. show you this slide as well. Apologies. Uh, I was a little bit worried that I was running out of time. So I, I just want, I meant to show you this slide as well. Um, and Dongo didn't want to let me pass the bucket to him. Um, so part of the, uh, the, the industrial, green industrialization vision of the Namibian government. And we have focused on Namibia because this is where we found the most advanced projects and the most articulate vision of at least what Mkandawire would call a developmentalist ideology. I think we can see it there very clearly, but it is instead of being based around, you know, the traditional view of uh, carrots and sticks kind of uh, arrangement or partnership with, with uh, local oligarchs, local uh, capitalists, what we are seeing is a, in the first stage, a de-risking partnership with a German, uh, productive capital and uh, global financial capital. And in the second stage, uh, the Namibian government is trying, is planning to, to develop a, a platform called SDG Namibia One that is going to scale up industrial policy via the risking, right? Again, with the same logic of, we have to uh, mobilize private capital, we have to mobilize foreign investment to come into investable green projects in, in Namibia. And to do so, we need to shift some of the risks from the private uh, investors or from private projects onto the state of, onto the balance sheet of either the state or onto the balance sheet of multilateral development banks that are involved in this. The World Bank has already been part of writing a, a feasibility uh, study. So, uh, 
it is a logic of partnerships. It is there, so there is a developmentalist ideology, that, but uh, with a updating or or that deviation, if you want, so that I will let uh, Ndongo talk about, with a deviation from the original developmental state logic, where uh, this developmentalist ideology is articulated through a, in the industrialization by by invitation. Okay. Um. So I'm going to share my screen once more. OK. Um, OK, did you see my screen? Donc, après ce que ce qu'a dit Daniela Gabor, donc euh, la question que nous sommes posée, c'est que dans quelle mesure, en fait, euh, ces projets d'hydrogène vert euh, en Afrique, tel que l'exemple euh, Namibien le montre, en fait, euh, s'inscrivent dans la voie du, euh, de l'état développementiste euh, décrit par euh, Tandika mukanda -Wire. Et donc, dans son article de 2001, en fait, Tandika euh, définit l'état développementiste à partir de deux composantes, ce qu'il appelle la, la structure idéologie, en fait, le, le, le nexus idéologie structure. Donc, euh, l'état développementaliste, en fait, c'est un état aussi qui a une idéologie développementaliste. Donc, c'est-à-dire un état qui fait ce qu'il faut pour promouvoir le développement économique et ce qui signifie généralement, euh, en fait, la croissance économique et l'industrialisation. Mais il y a une autre composante, c'est, euh, disons, la capacité de l'État à mettre en place les politiques euh, économiques, en fait, les politiques économiques de, de développement. Et donc, dans, dans la pensée de Macan de Viré, en fait, on voit clairement qu'au départ, je veux dire, au moment des, des indépendances, euh, les pays africains avaient des États faibles, mais une idéologie, euh, disons, développementiste. Donc, euh, l'idéologie était là, mais la structure n'était pas vraiment là. Et donc, ces États ont dé développé des, des, des capacités pour mettre en place des politiques de développement, des politiques industrielles qui ont eu des, des fortunes diverses. Après, on a eu les agissements structurels au niveau des années 80. Et donc là, Macandewe nous dit qu'en fait, l'idéologie n'était pas du tout développementiste. C'était, voilà, uh, get price right, etc. Et... et, et aussi, euh, les États africains ont vu leur capacité euh, être diminuée significativement par les euh, politiques d'ajustement structurel. C'est pourquoi il parlait de l'État africain mal ajusté, mal ajusté uh, African uh, States, African Economies. Et donc, euh, là, euh, on est dans un nouveau paradigme où, euh, comme nous le montrons dans, dans, dans notre article, il y a un appétit pour, euh, pour l'État. Donc, euh, c'est un État qui est un peu plus important que l'État de Wall Street. Euh, du Washington Consensus, mais c'est un État qui doit agir seulement dans une direction déterminée et, euh, que Daniela a bien montré, c'est-à-dire des risking, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut euh, minimiser les risques pour les investisseurs, euh, c'est-à-dire que ce soit investisseurs euh, financiers ou investisseurs en fait dans des activités productives, industrielles, il faut minimiser les risques et donc euh, il faut un ensemble euh, en tout cas, un environnement euh, financier, euh, fiscal, euh, euh, en tout cas aussi administratif, qui euh, favorise en fait euh, la venue du capital étranger. Et donc, les projets d'hydrogène s'inscrivent dans ce cadre-là qui a été critiqué par Tandika en son temps, qui est le développement par euh, invitation. C'est-à-dire que euh, ce sont les euh, entreprises euh, étrangères, ce sont les capitaux étrangers qui définissent ce que doit être euh, le type d'industrialisation, qui doivent être aussi définir le cadre dans lequel, en fait, euh, leur activité euh, se décline en, dans ces pays-là. Or, pour nous, en fait, dans la perspective de, de Tandika, en fait, l'État développementiste doit être en mesure de discipliner le, le capital étranger et doit aussi être en mesure de euh, stimuler à l'écologion de, de, de champions nationaux. Mais tout ça, vous ne l'avez pas dans le cadre du développement par, par invitation tel qu'on peut le voir à travers euh, le cas namibien. Et donc, euh, dans le cas des projets d'hydrogène vert, on a aussi cette hypothèse que ce sont les, euh, en tout cas, les capitaux étrangers qui viendront en fait avec leurs capacités. Donc, l'État lui-même n'a pas besoin de développer ces capacités-là euh, pour son propre développement et aussi pour avoir la maîtrise du processus de transformation économique. Et donc là également, c'est un risque en fait que, que les États en cours en s'inscrivent dans ce type de euh, partenariat où les capacités en fait l'État à réguler euh, l'économie et aussi à mettre en place des projets de développement effectifs sont euh, entre les mains du euh, secteur euh, privé financier euh, global. Et donc là également, 
c'est que ça passe souvent, c'est qu'il y a un rôle particulier qui est euh, assigné aux banques centrales, qui deviennent des institutions très importantes et qui s'inscrivent dans cette perspective euh, de limiter les risques pour les investisseurs euh, Étranger. Et donc, ça, ça va aussi à, à l'encontre de l'État développementiste qui doit reposer sur une coordination, une articulation entre les autorités fiscales, les autorités monétaires et aussi les autorités en charge de la politique euh, industrielle. Donc, ça veut dire qu'à euh, l'époque où nous sommes, euh, un État développementaliste doit être un État développementaliste euh, vert. Mais euh, cet État développementaliste vert ne peut pas céder aux sirènes, disons, du Wall Street Consensus. Euh, il doit nécessairement en fait, aller à, à, à rebours de l'idéologie de Wall Street Consensus qui, quand on l'est à juste à éliminer les risques pour le secteur privé. Et donc, c'est seulement en fait, en, disons, en allant à rebours de ce Wall Street Consensus euh, qu'en en fait, il sera possible, de, en tout cas, de faire advenir euh, l'État développementaliste, mais aussi l'État développementaliste vert euh, qui pourrait euh, donner euh, une vision euh, concrète, en tout cas, mettre euh, en œuvre en fait, l'utopie énergétique euh, de Sheran de Diop euh, en son temps. Donc, Daniela, probablement, want to say something. No, thank you very much. We look forward mm -hmm. to your questions. Thank you so much, Ndongo and uh, Daniela, for this uh, very interesting presentation. I think a green developmental state is, is clearly uh, taking the ideas of Tandika further and is something that will be very relevant uh, equally uh, together with industrial green industrial policies uh, to, to actually take advantage of this possibility of coming late and leapfrogging. Uh, and at the same time, of course, relating to foreign capital and support, but also developing you know, the domestic capacity and uh, not only industrial, but also state capacity. So thank you very much for, for setting this out and also talking about some possible Uh, challenges associated with this particular uh, model that we see in Namibia, but which is also taking uh, space uh, across the continent. And I'm also sure that there will be a lot of questions um, on this case study, and please put your questions in the chat box. And now I hope that we have sorted out the technical problems and can listen to the presentation by Professor Akua. You have the floor. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, let me apologize uh, for this um, hiccup. Yeah, um, I want uh, to say that my presentation, which is on agriculture and African development planning, is based on a, a publication titled Post Independence Development Planning in Ghana and Tanzania Agriculture, Women and Nation Building, published in the Provincial Journal of African Development. And uh, this was part of the post-colonialism project today. And um, this article was motivated uh, by Ghana and Tanzania's experiences, which positioned agricultural transformation as a basis for national self-sufficiency. There were a few striking things about the development plan, which was the use of agriculture as a mechanism to link all sectors of Uh, the economy and the strategic position of the state in production, distribution, and employment creation. I reviewed them for their strengths and weaknesses in search for suggestions that could serve as a critical starting point for uh, developing and pursuing alternative development strategies in Africa. And with this as a backdrop, I welcome as a result my involvement in this uh, event, which is honoring Professor Kandike Mkandariri and some of the organizers, especially Professor Jimmy Adesina for making this part of it. My gratitude also goes to the institutional support that makes this event uh, possible, for this year, UN Institute for Social Development, the University of South South Africa's chair in social policy. The salience of his uh, social change in youth scholarship is so glaring at this point in history. And presenter after presenter have highlighted this point. You know, I just want to bring up 
and also thank uh, the presenters before me. And I find it so refreshing that I'm part of this community Sorry, that tries to situate um, academia with social change. Sorry, Prof. The sound is not good for the interpreters. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what do I do now? Yeah, it's, still yeah, yeah. it's still not good enough. It's still not good enough. Hello. Hello, yes, Prof. Hello, it's still not good enough. Okay, uh, please uh, give us just uh, one minute to check this because they are having problem to do their work. Okay. Uh, Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, uh, Prof, can you please uh, be Hello. more close? More, yeah, can you be uh, please more close to the mic okay. in order okay. to increase the quality of the the sound? Okay. Sarah, can you please check at your site? Hello, is Sarah, it is it better? Microphone. Yes, it, it seems is to it be better? better. Yes, okay. it seems to be better like that. Okay. 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 Sarah okay. and Beatrice, can you please uh, check and confirm at your site? Hello, is it better? Yes, yes, better. Thank you. Thank you. My, Thank you. My, my apologies. Thank my you. apologies Thank once you. again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was talking about the salience of, of this exercise, uh, which has been highlighted in previous um, presentations, in particular, the refreshing keynote address, uh, mentioning the environmental crisis, the health, military provocations, uh, and, and the endless list of um, self-induced crises that are part and parcel of this liberal agenda that we are all pursuing as development. For us in Ghana, it comes at a time when there's great despondency about our ability to do anything and, and uh, anything that, uh, and um, also marshal the capacity to build what it takes to have a developmental state. And um, even though my publication looked at the compared Tanzania and Ghana for brevity and, and questions of time, I'd like to concentrate just on Ghana. And uh, the, the fact that early post-independent governments actually were developmental in focus and approach is uh, a, an example that Ghana presents in our first president, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah who was interested in non-capitalist models to deviate from this Western-induced modernization and to delink the nation from the political and economic ramifications of this incorporation through colonialism into the global capitalist uh, system. Now, um, let me say that for this exercise, I drew mainly from secondary sources, looking at the development plans and publications and all that. I was interested in uh, dwelling on the Marxist approach to focus on social power relations that the plan set out to transform or reform in the agricultural sector. I was also curious about how the plans sought to use agriculture to restructure the national economy within the broader international capitalist system. How did the plans analyze gender relations and what the development plan is conceived as limiting the agricultural sector and how they uh, set out to address the perceived limitations. Now, um, the, the plans, uh, as as uh, I have mentioned, sought to deviate from the traditional colonial orientation, the liberal thing. And 
And this is important because at independence, Ghana had inherited a 10 year industrialization by invitation model uh, that had been set up by the colonial administration. Some have wondered why Nkoma very clear about his limitations adopted this. Others have said it was strategic and pragmatic so that uh, the whole process for independence was not delayed. But it became critical at a point uh, and the seven year development plan was what was used to herald this deviation. The entry point really was the state control over supplies of the vital springs of economic activity and for generating the needed resources to grow the economy. What was striking about this is that its identification of what constitutes the problems of agricultural sector and how the, the shortcomings that were outlined are still under discussion now. For example, it's, it's I highlighted the fact that food prices were a threat to the standard of living, political stability, and economic dream. The plan also wanted to set up a foundation uh, for uh, cutting research and advancing technology also to pursue the agenda. So we could see here in terms of its comprehensiveness, and that it wasn't just modernizing agriculture, but educational sector was designed to supply the necessary Ghanaian workforce and APES institutions to provide research, to feed the plan, to also feed the development of inputs for seeds, for breed and all that. And Kume's lament really was their plans inability to cover the entire uh, continent. So what in the main were the goals of this development plan? First was to provide industrial raw materials. And this plan heralded the import substitution industrialization. So first to provide raw materials for the import substitution industrialization to also assist in the accumulation of capital to support hard and soft infrastructure and to reduce domestic food production deficits. Here, the courses that were identified were production and distribution, or marketing, low technologies, post-harvest losses, low quality of livestock and poultry breed, and the lack of reliable marketing facilities and a heavy reliance on cocoa for the international market. So the solutions were captured as captured in the development plan occurred under three tasks, namely uh, nutritional improvement and the elimination of food sufficiency deficit, something that is still under discussion now, raising incomes in rural Ghana, with a specific focus on regions that had been created as labor reserves. I'm referring to the northern and upper regions of Ghana. And the increasing raw material production for local industries and export markets. Now, local industries were meant uh, to substitute for uh, imports. And these imports were to save um, needed resources and to reduce uh, also the and, and enhance the nation's balance of payments uh, positioning. So here we could see that this plan also had embedded in it the financing for development. What, what were some of the specific uh, strategies? modernizing agriculture meant that support was provided for peasant farmers, setting up cooperatives and state farms to undertake large-scale farming because collectivized farming was seen as one of the solutions to feed industries and produce also and deal with um, food security, but also to be the entry points for the introduction of new technologies in agriculture. Then there was also the expansion in grants for agricultural research. 
So research in agriculture was not left to chance, but was part and parcel of this plan. The state also assumed responsibility for reducing post-harvest losses, marketing, um, cooperatives, and, and storage facilities. There was also the uh, setting up of the fishery subsector to meet protein needs. So the state fishing corporation, and the target was 30,000 tons of, of fish a, a yearly. And of course, there was nationwide provision of cold storage and distribution facilities. Private fisher, uh, fishers also were not left out. They were also targeted to receive larger mechanized and uh, training, uh, which was to be done through their cooperatives. So in terms of one, uh, one of the major institutional reforms also was the introduction of the Ministry for Cooperatives to deal with cooperatives in order to take care of peasant forms of production. Now, as I, I have mentioned, the, the reasons for modernizing agriculture were economic, but also political. It was seen as political. And the political strategies also were meant to deal with local hostility. And uh, forming cooperatives was one of it, especially local hostility to the organized uh, stronghold in Ashanti region. And also deal with uh, the land, the issue around land tenure to grant uh, members of uh, land holding groups uh, because we, we have had a plural system which was left intact uh, because uh, discussions elsewhere have mentioned the fact that this served the interest of colonial, uh, um, the colonial administration. And it, it meant that uh, traditional authorities had hold and could undermine any attempt at collectivized forms of farming. So this communal tenure practices uh, uh, the regime sought to do, um, bring up legislative reforms so that it could uh, deal with uh, problems of large scale land acquisition and offer tenure security to tenure, um, tenant and migrant farms. Then, uh, but this legislation also gives states control over land it could circumscribe communal tenure practices, support freehold land acquisition and, and, and all that. Yeah. Indeed, there were some achievements. The achievements were that by his overthrow in 1966, and then there was a wide range of industrial based, uh, agricultural based industries. You know, we could look to uh, read more about the GIHOP, which is a Ghana Industrial Holding Corporation. And uh, the number of state farms had grown. Uh, the youth um, uh, brigades and workers brigades. And, and this policy also targeted young persons. You know, and, and all these camps had, had also grown. Uh, the cooperatives also had expanded from 992 to 1,732. There was in place also an elaborate storage and marketing systems that delivered foods products to urban workers and removed from fa peasant farmers the need to find markets and deal with post-harvest losses. As um, I had mentioned my curiosity was not just in the successes. Uh, in order to draw lessons, it was important to find out why the plans did not succeed, because they are critical for engaging the developmental state currently. First, uh, but before I do that, let me uh, run quickly to the whole question of dealing with patriarchy. Because one of, uh, of the striking things in my comparison of Tanzania and Ghana was the role women played, especially women in the informal economy played in the nationalist struggles. And it was very clear that for their mobilization and even financial resources, there would have been a limit to what would have achieved. But then uh, the, the plans to modernize uh, agriculture failed to provide 
peasant farmers and traders uh, any respite. In fact, based on the liberalist tradition that women's uh, position was framed, there was more of affirmative action pro provisions that tended to favor women who had formal sector education. And very quickly also, the inadequacies in the land reforms meant that women's access to land within the plural legal systems was inadequately addressed. So what were some of the problems and what are some of the lessons we have, uh, we can deduce from some of the uh, shortcomings in this? I look at it in terms of three major areas, the ideological underpinnings of the development plans, the key development actors and their levels of political and economic control. Very clearly, the, 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 there was an ideological focus to this. And for Nkuma, uh, there was need to deliver within what he had identified as African socialism. He was clearly convinced that capitalism could not hold the answers and that the, 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 there was need to look within the African humanistic values that was more communalistic and that liberalism really focused more on individualistic tendencies. And for us, because we were more located within the African humanistic values, it was easier for us to move directly from uh, uh, leapfrog into, the, into socialism without any disruptive uh, um, consequences. The second, uh, for me, uh, so this is really very strong. It backs what was taken. And the fact that then it saw the liberal, plural liberalism also as detrimental to the nation building and therefore felt that a one party state was critical. Then uh, the, the economic strategies also were very clear about the state, the need for the state to have complete control over all the productive uh, uh, spaces. And here, very few areas were left to private capital. The development actors also were Ghanaian labor. And that was also very clear. So that labor was an active, and here it was a wage labor. Labor was an active developmental agent and it therefore required to be protected as well. But as I have mentioned, women's role in, in, in national development really focused more on women with formal education and neglected the women who had been active in an independent struggle, that is women without formal education. So with this, I want to look at some of the shortcomings that should be lessons that we can bring into the present day discourse on developing a developmental state. The first is a failure to fully delink the national economy from the global capitalist political economy that has positioned Ghana as a primary producer and keeping the linkage really, as some has said, uh, amounted to effectively postponing the political formulation that will address the class contradictions within African societies and between African countries at one end and the capitalist, Western capitalist countries. The second also was the dependence on earnings from cash crops to finance development. That's for Ghana, it made it very easy to undermine the development project and create the necessary disaffection that made the coup d'etat very, very possible. That's the other one also was that 
the state's influence over the productive resources, the constraining effect, and over productive resources in ways that did not give it actual control over the foreign reserves meant that there was a lot of hemorrhage in the local foreign reserves through the repatriation of profits from the industries that had been invited to support in the industrialization process. Then there also the question of the emerging developmental access, developmental actors. Very clearly, there was very little in terms of mobilizing an ideological constituency that owned the development projects that had a deep understanding and implementation and, and the implications for national coherence. So that the failure on the part of the nationalist movement to cultivate a class conscious, grassroots class conscious constituency that owned this development project, for me, I believe, is what made this exercise so easy to undermine and also present us with deep questions about our ability to erect a developmental state. So it is not a question of if Africa can run, Africa must run. The question is how. And the lessons from exploring Ghana's develop, seven year development plan that really, and still, uh, the, the, the foundation it laid is what is carrying our nation up till now. This, the absence of a constituency that builds it, that owns it, that carries forward is what we should be addressing in terms of looking for alternatives. Thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much, Professor Akua. That, that was a very, very interesting and inspiring analysis of the Ghana experience. And again, I can see uh, so many linkages, not only with Tandika's work and our question for a developmental state and what are the pillars of such a developmental state, but also in terms of the arguments that Professor Fiona raised uh, precisely on that constituency um, and, you know, what, what Tandika sometimes called or called in a, also in a famous publication, moving from the national question to the social question. Um, but without further ado, I would like to um, pass to our final speaker, Dr. Eyo Balcha Gebre Maria from the University of Bristol in the UK, and also, as Jimmy mentioned already, the recipient of the 2022 Tandika Mekandawiri Prize for Outstanding Scholarship in African Political Economy and Economic Development. So we yeah, are very happy to have you here, Eyob, talking about what does the Ethiopian experiment of developmentalism mean for Mekandawiri's model of an African developmental state? Lessons and critical reflections. Eyob, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Katja. Uh, I totally enjoyed all the presentations and uh... I think the people who were here in the first half of the session are missing a lot from the past three presentations. So I hope I will keep the level of interest uh, at equal length and I will just delve into my presentation. Uh, I thank all the organizers, uh, South of the UNISA, uh, South African Chair for Social Policy, Kodesla and Andres for inviting me to this esteemed panel. Uh, I consider myself as one of the luckiest young African scholars who had the opportunity of calling myself a colleague to Tandika during my time as a fellow at the London School of Economics International Development Department. In addition to being inspired from his fabulous intellectual work, I also had the opportunity to have extended chat with him to step in his shoes and give a, a lecture on his behalf to convene the African Development Postgraduate course that he used to co-convene at the department. And this year, the utmost privilege of winning 
that can become a Kindle Rapid Prize for year 2022. So my title is what does a Japan experiment can tell us about the, the uh, Kindle model. In this brief submission, I would like to make three interrelated arguments on the feasibility of the developmental set in Africa by taking the Japan case, particularly between the period between 2001 and 2018. The first argument is that I argue that the now different uh, Japan ruling party, EPRDF, the Japan People's Revolution Democratic Front. Uh, those of you who know Japan politics who are very much familiar with this term, the EPRDF, its developmentalist orientation evolved from its revolutionary democracy ideology, which helped envisioning a strong state committed, committed to broad-based development. The developmentalist ideology rendered the transformational impetus to the long history of the Egyptian statehood. A good example with this regard is the oral centered in agriculture focused development policy of this particular region. Second, EPRDF's developmentalism went against the narrow market focused institutional reform to pursue a developmentalist institution building. By foregrounding the state's primary role in development, the regime rejected the technocratic capacity building package that donors pursued in their good governance agenda. Instead, the government pursued execution capacity building reform to ingrain its developmentalist orientation within the state structure. The capacity to, ex to execute transformational development was the quintessential purpose of EPRDF's institutional reform. The third argument is EPRDF pursued its developmentalist mission by cordoning off its policy space, both from uh, internal and external actors. Internally, the regime had a relative autonomy to implement a policy of mobilizing vast sums of capital from the banking sector to finance its development, development projects. The regime also implemented a political legal framework that dried up flow of foreign funding for local civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations, more of in a very repressive sense. Externally, the regime maintained a policy sovereignty to keep donors from influencing its interventionist approach to development. So these are the key arguments that I made in the paper that I submitted for the competition to win the Pandicam Kindle Prize. So by way of elaborating on the above arguments, um, I aim to illustrate how the Egyptian model of developmentalism demonstrates an illuminating example of the famous the 2001 article thinking about developmental self in Africa, where Tandika talked about the ideology structure nexus, effective state capacity, and the relative autonomy as key arguments, as key and essential features of a developmental state. Before I go deeper into my presentation, I would like to share a quote by the late Ethiopian Prime Minister, Mele Zenawi, who was the architect, the brain behind the Ethiopian developmental state. Uh, he said, quote, development is a political process first and an economic and social process after. It is the creation of a political setup that is conducive to accelerated development that sets the ball of development rolling, end of quote. One of the essential components of a political setup for developmentalism is a developmentalist ideology. Iperative developmentalist ideology is, as I said, derived from its revolution democracy ideology. Revolution democracy is an ideology devoted to the rural mass with a solid conviction to transform the lives of the rural community. The ideology built its orientation based on the lived reality of Ethiopians in the early 1990s, where 85% of the Ethiopian population lived, resided in the rural areas and under abject poverty and material destitution. EPRDF argued, and its, it's ideology envisioned that the development of Ethiopia is unthinkable unless this rural mass with the abundant labor and land 
is transformed through rural development and agricultural focus programs. Revolution demography also laid a strong foundation for developmental statism so that Karadev managed to shape its relation with both internal and external political actors. With regard to uh, internal political actors, establishing a dominant party political settlement at the later stage of the developmentalism, of course, with broad based in transformational orientation, was quite important. I must say the internal politics under the clarity was quite authoritarian and far from those parade democratic questions of the Ethiopian people. Plus, the ethnicization of politics and the extra emphasis given to horizontal inequalities among ethno-linguistic groups and social cultural groups in the institutional design of the federal government become the Achilles heel of the Ethiopian developmentalist region. In terms of the external relations, this ideology and later on the development orientation kept the likes of the World Bank and the IMF away from being meddling into the development policy decision making process of the Ethiopian state. So the one size fits all policy recommendations of deregulation, liberalization, privatization were not happening in Ethiopia to the extent of at least as we see it in many African countries in the 1980s uh, and 90s and early 2000s. The first, perhaps the most consequential resistance of IMF's mission to impose its policy prescription happened in the late 1990s and early 2000s when Mala Zenawi said enough and rejected the IMF's push to open the capital account for market-based exchange rates and to liberalize the Nasset financial market. Robert Webb's piece entitled Capital and Revenge, the IMF and Ethiopia, published in 2001, on challenge and Joseph Stiglitz's recollection of his conversation with the prime minister in his book, Globalization is, it's, and its discontents can help us understand how EPRDF resisted the Washington consensus. Keeping the government in control of the commanding heads of the Ethiopian economy immensely contributed to launch the developmentalist project. The role of government in steering the production, ownership, and distribution of rents and essential resources, and the capacity to use it for developmentalist goal drive the period of accelerated economic growth in Ethiopia, particularly between 2004 and 2018. During this period, Ethiopia's GDP grew at 10.4% annually, imagine for almost a period of 14 years, a 10%. GDP growth and also a 7.4 GDP per capita growth. However, we all know that limitations of GDP based characterizations of economic performance. So here are some tangible outcomes of the, the developmentalist region and its accelerated growth period. Over the 10 years period of 2004 and 2014 15, there were 50,000 agricultural extension workers, 9,000 farmers training centers, which is one in every two families, that means the, locals, the lowest tier of government. 15,000 health posters were built and 30,000 health extension workers, workers were deployed across rural Ethiopia. And Ethiopia achieved most of the, the previous millennium Devo development goals uh, earlier than the say, 2015 uh, deadline. More specifically, public spending for this improving human capital and infrastructure was one of the key manifestations of this developmentalist region. The Ethiopian case shows that developmental commitment of the region was quite poor, poor in its spending. The aspiring developmental region allocated 66.9 percent of its public spending, almost sometimes even 70% over the period of 2008 and 2016, 66.9% of its public spending goes to education, health, agriculture, roads, and water. So this is what 
a developmentalist orientation and its practice for me, having a broad-based approach in the implementation of social economic policies. No African country can invest this much heavily into its economy with their social economic decision making being under the tight control of Britain Woods institutions. Until recently, or until I would say the current leadership come to power in 2018, Ethiopia has a relatively autonomous policy making space, a topic which I will return later. Second, almost at the same time that Tandika's paper, Thinking About Developmental States in Africa, was published in 2001. The Ethiopian government, under the premier, premiership of the late Mel Zenari, also published the five essential policy documents on rural development, democratic order, uh, industrial policy, and foreign policy. And the fifth one, the one that I'm discussing now, the execution capacity buildings and strategies program. This is one of the key documents that usually is kind of overlooked when we usually talk about the Ethiopian industrial case, industrialization case. This particular policy document contains that enhancing execution capacity is a quintessential aspect of initiation building and necessary to achieve development. In doing so, the policy identified three development forces, the government, the society in general, and the private sector. Whilst recognizing the vital role of all three of these development forces, the policy document identified the government as the primary development force whose capacity needs to be prioritized. The government is also assigned the extra responsibility of leading and coordinating the other development forces and building their capacity. The policy document argued that execution capacity is essentially relational, hence contextual, not something just to be copy pasted from the West. It argues that execution, capa court, execution capacity emanates from society's effort to transform nature and its social relations to maximize the advantage and convenience of its members, end of quote. By centering relationality, the policy contends that execution capacity is not about the abundance of pieces of machinery and instruments. Rather, it is essentially about the purposeful, effective, and developmental utilization of machines and instruments. It is imperative to note that the policy focuses explicitly on execution, which differs from the commonly used notion of capacity building. The execution capacity building that ECRD pursued differs from the capacity building that donor agencies sponsored with their good government, with their good governance package. The latter part of the initial monocropping and, on, and monotasking that Andy Kamek and Luari talked about in his 2011 book chapter, and also Peter Evans also has the same uh, topic. It is informed by, especially the, the good governance agenda, is informed by what Olukoshi said, the narrow and technocratic and functionalist understanding of government. What Ikari Dave framed as execution capacity building is a holistic purpose-driven developmentalist mission of altering the interplay among development forces by focusing on human resource procedures and organization. The mission is to equip the state with the capacity to pursue transformative development rather than just imitating the image of Western states. The policy document adopted a comprehensive capacity development strategy and identified the three actors, as I mentioned, the government of society in the private sector, and give the government the responsibility to coordinate and lead. The rationality to prioritize the government is derived from the policy definition of the overall objective of developmental orientation is different from the horizon and content in horizon and content from those that give the market a free ride on the other end and all those who assign everything to the government. The strategy argues that the Ethiopian model will be neither of the two extremes. Instead, the, the strategy aspires to 
empower and enhance the capacity of all development forces, but by prioritizing the government. The strategy gives further clarity by emphasizing that not every aspect of the government will be prioritized. The strategy primarily focuses on the government's execution capacity. The strategy claims that enhancing execution capacity is necessary to implement the other development strategies. So be it rural development or urban issues or industrial development or democratic capacity building, everything relies on the capacity of the government to execute what it has put in its documents. So it's creating those institutional capacity from within based on the context was the most uh, greater emphasis that the government, the EPRDF document uh, talks about. The regime's developmentalist orientation understands that it, 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 this kind of approach helped the government even to co-opt the interventions by donors with their own very limited perspective. A good example with this regard is a World Bank sponsored program called the Public Sector Capacity Building Program, which was uh, intended to transform uh, three critical aspects of state society relations, inclusion, accountability, and cohesion. Whilst the program focused on transferring technical skills, policy orientations, and practices into the Ethiopian body politics, the regime approached the program with a developmentalist mindset and ensured that execution capacity of the state was kind of prioritized as an idea this program was an ideal example of institutional monocropping that uh, both Tandika and Peter Ivan were talking about. It was quite technocratic and making the government much more efficient and service delivery and ensuring accountability of public officials to the citizens, which is good by itself. However, the end outcome of the program was more of consolidating and upward accountability of senior uh, apart accountability to senior officials and the top down policy planning and implementation that favors more of consensus rather than contestation and parts uh, like bottom up participation that the, the program initially envisaged. The program had also that monotasking feature that Sandy Kandikandwari highlighted in its emphasis of service delivery as an aspect of government support with minimum attention given to the transformational and developmental role. In a nutshell, concerning the donors' capacity building agenda, with, uh, concerning the donors' capacity building agenda, EPRDF pursued a diametrically opposite aspiration through its execution capacity building policy. The donor agencies promoted the technocratic, universally applied, expert led programs of capacity building. EPRDF in its turn designed and successfully implemented a relational context specific political program of execution capacity building. For me, this particular policy uh, was essentially about acquiring what Tandika called in that particular uh, paper. I quote the capacity to implement socioeconomic policies sagaciously and effectively. He italized capacity in this court, in this uh, uh, segment. So that capacity is quite essential. In the last segment of my presentation, I want to briefly speak about the relative autonomy that uh, the, the, the period of freedom had enjoyed. We can say that Perry pursued his, its agenda through a relatively autonomous position from a, an autonomous position. Locally, the role of civil society organizations, media, and organized political groups was extremely constrained through what most people call draconian legal frameworks. The authoritarian nature of the Ethiopian experiment of developmentalism is unquestionable. However, it's hugely important to underscore the grave problems of leaving the civic space of a given country open to Trojan forces of neoliberal political and economic actors. So whilst agreeing with personally with Icardia's response to the hypocrisy of Western countries 
with regard to avoiding meddling of foreign actors in their national politics. I also believe that the regime took extreme actions and committed gross atrocities against citizens who had genuine concern with regard to the unrepresentativeness of the region and its repressive nature. The Italian regime also enjoyed a relative autonomy from domestic private sector by implementing policies that contributed meaningfully to its developmental orientation. One major example with this regard is the National Bank of Ethiopia directive that came out in April 2011. The directive required every bank, every private bank, to buy treasury bills from the National Bank of Ethiopia, corresponding to 27% of their monthly plans of loans or advanced disbursements. The National Bank of Ethiopia then transferred part of the bills purchased to the Government Policy Bank, the Development Bank of Ethiopia. Then the Development Bank of Ethiopia dispersed the money to private sectors that were involved in government selected priority sectors and to finance other development projects of the federal government. By the end of 2018, the National Bank of Ethiopia raised around 2.8 billion US dollars from private commercial banks. It's important to note that the development financing through the government's policy bank, the uh, Development Bank of Ethiopia, encountered serious problems of high ratio of non-performing loans, loans, embezzlement, and corruption. And the current leadership has already repealed the directive and currently there is no such mechanism. However, the principle, the idea, and the capacity to execute such kind of resource mobilization mechanism and to put it in place cannot be uh, underemphasized. So what? What are the lessons that we can draw from uh, the Ethiopian case? And what, what, what can we share about the feasibility of the development of the state projects in Africa based on the Ethiopian case? One, I have three points. The first one is developmentalist orientation. It's an ideological conviction to transform society, the majority of African men and young people. Socioeconomic policies that apply the logics of the financial industry and strictly adhering to the principles of the market can hardly address the structural bottlenecks of African economies. The structural challenges of African economies are found in the patterns of production and consumption. Since the Lagos plan of action, this, uh, this has already been well articulated. We produce what we don't consume and we consume what we don't produce. Mainstream development thinking and market-oriented approach cannot address these hurdles because such approaches remain focused on the symptoms of the problem, negative trade balance, current account, in the state of the root causes. For example, if we take the case of African countries that belong to the franc zone, the feasibility of a developmental state is just unthinkable. The 15 West African and West and Central African countries, including Comoros, constitute 14% of Africa's total population. The book by one of our uh, fellow panelists, co-authored by uh, Dongo Sam Seal and Fanny Piguet. Africa's last colonial currency, the Sefa Frank story, it gives us the, the harrowing account of neocolonialism as we speak now, and how these countries do not own their economy, but the French treasury is in total command. So how can you think about the development started project in this kind of context? Point two, institutional reform and design cannot be copy pasted from the West. Africa's developmental challenge need organically designed, politically conscious, and contextually relevant institutions than an institutional monocropping and monotasking that still continues in different shape and form. Tandika commented on this approach, a one-size-fits-all approach, which gives us a size that doesn't fit anyone. I take the case of Africa's celebrated democracies, such as Zambia, Malawi, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, which are widely known for consolidating democracy because of the relatively stable transition of power between competing political parties. Despite successfully replicating competitive democracies and institutions of liberal democracy, 
This country's lack policy consistency as the elites lack the incentive to have a long-term horizon for transformative policy making, industrialization, and institution building. Oftentimes, incumbents are busy with the task of winning the next election on day two of assuming power, which becomes a priority than putting in place developmentalist institutions in place. For me, setting an, uh, setting an articulated and consolidated developmentalist orientation should be parallel, if not proceed the democratic agenda, especially the liberal democratic agenda. Third, the third reality that the success and experimenting of developmental status in, in Ethiopia is currently reversed by a new leadership that plays to the tunes of the World Bank and IMF. This tells us that the non-ending, that it is a non-ending struggle both at the national and international level, building or aspiring for a developmental status, a non-ending struggle both at the national and international level. The incumbent Ethiopian regime is busy in undoing the developmentalist orientation and heavily focused on liberalizing the telecom and finance sector, privatizing state-owned industries, and going up the ladder of the ordered banks is of doing business index. The defamation of government, the role of like kind of blacklisting the role of government in development and uncritical praise for private sector has become a dominant narrative of senior government officials. Most socioeconomic policies are designed with the dictation and the blessings of either IMF or World Bank installed technical advisors in the key government decision-making spaces, which is turning Ethiopia, I believe, from a non-democracy to one of the choiceless democracies that Tandika referred in one of his works in the 1990s. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eyob, for this inspiring talk and for bringing in a very detailed analysis of the Ethiopian model, which is, of course, very, very important and very insightful for the discussion on developmental states. It's often referred to as one of the examples of a strong state, and you have identified uh, the, the key elements also of the success of the model, but also some challenges and also some threats in a way that are coming from, from, from the international, but also from the national context. And uh, just to say that uh, I found it very interesting that you also referred to horizontal inequalities and how you know that was taken into account in the governance process that you mentioned public spending and how one can kind of read uh, read a developmental orientation of the government also through budgets. Um, the, this focus and analysis of the of the uh, document that talks about execution capacity, I think, was fascinating, uh, especially in conversation with the good governance, um, uh, uh, good governance literature and and recommendations, and that actually, when we talk about state capacity, uh, it is really important. To say it's it's not only about you know the the rule of law and 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 the, the the proper functioning of you know accountability and state institutions, but also creating political consensus, raising mobilizing revenues, and actually implementing uh, policies. So this was very interesting, and I'm now happy to to open the floor uh, for questions. I think we we went a little bit about over time but we have a couple of minutes for questions from the floor. Um, so I'm just taking a look at the, um, the, the Q&A box and I see that there are two new questions. Um, so I'm not sure whether someone from the panel can actually respond to the first question because it refers to the Nigerian Central Bank. Um, and, uh, but maybe we can open up that question um, uh, to, to, to a more general one. You know, the, the, the person asks, um, could anyone offer an assessment, um, you know, on the role of the central bank in light of McKendawe's views uh, in a developmental state? So uh, if, if anyone would like to respond 
to that question and I immediately also read out the second question. Um, and then I invite, you know, each panelist to respond uh, to either of these. Um, so Marian Uma asks, um, you know, could, could you comment on the current debt situation heightened by rising interest rates that some African countries find themselves that seem to be leading us back to another area of structural adjustment? So what does it mean for the development in Africa? And what are the options for African countries in this situation? Is delinking, decoupling from developed economies viable and a feasible option? Um, I also see that there is a hand raised um, from an attendee. So I also invite that person, if possible, to take the floor and ask the question directly. So I'm not sure whether it was still a hand raised from the last round. So if nobody takes the floor, then I would like to um, ask one additional question from my side and which I would like to ask to all of the panelists. If you could uh, identify maybe two or three conditions that you see important in, in, in terms of the feasibility of creating developmental states, maybe even democratic and inclusive developmental states, or if we want to put another adjective, developmental, democratic developmental green uh, states uh, in the region. So if from your research and your presentation, in terms of conclusions, could you identify two or three conditions that you think need to happen actually to put this vision uh, into reality? Um, so I would like um, to, to, to start again with uh, Dr. Grieva Chava and invite you to um, respond to questions uh, and and maybe I have also a final comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hujo. And uh, thanks, colleagues. I, I really enjoyed all the presentations. I mean, they were fascinating, um, very interesting. Uh, and so, Dr. Hujo, if I understand you correctly, you'd like for me to respond to the question in the chat or... Uh, I might have missed or respond to your particular question. There were basically there were basically two two questions in the chat. Uh, one was on the role of central banks uh, mm -hmm. in in the project of a developmental state, and the other question was around um, uh, you know how what are the prospects for developmental states in a, in the current uh, global situation where we see you know inflation, rising interest rates and a potential threat of austerity and new structural adjustment coming. So I, I just put out these, these questions and, and my question on you know, what you think needs to happen now um, to move a developmental agenda forward and you pick and choose what you think is, um, you, know, you would like to respond to. Okay, thank you. I think I, I, the first one is an interesting one about the role of the central bank uh, in the developmental state. Uh, and I think what we see rather worryingly is that, I mean, over the last 30 years or so, our central banks have become quite isolated uh, from, from the state and quite isolated from, uh, the, you know, the, the people, quite sort of quite autonomous. And again, that's almost a Bretton Woods institution uh, 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 sort of policy prescription. Right, that you know, every everybody else is emotive in Africa, so would like to have these technocrats be insulated and away from the people, so that they can engage in the technocratic work, and that work has been very much delimited to just a price stability or what is called inflation targeting, which is an, inc an incredible pity. I mean, I illustrate again in the Zambian case, we just passed recently a new central bank act. And that act uh, is quite explicit in doing two things. The first thing is that it makes the central bank governor uh, undismissible. You know, you can't dismiss him, him or her, can't dismiss them. Uh, to dismiss them, you have to engage in a very lengthy, 
process quite like dismissing a high court judge or Supreme Court justice, right? Uh, and, you know, one can argue maybe there are advantages to that, but essentially this is meant to completely insulate the central bank uh, from, the, uh, from engaging in, in activities that may cause, cause that developmental. The other thing that the Central Bank Act does is that it actually stipulates to the extent that there's a conflict between price stability and other societal objectives, price stability will always take precedence which is strange, right? Which is completely strange for uh, you know, a central bank. As we've seen in the historical record, central banks have been incredibly important in financing long-term development, making guarantees um, you know, to local, local firms, those kinds of things. So really, uh, I don't know the Nigerian case quite specifically, but I wouldn't be surprised to say it is probably not so different from the, uh, the trends we're seeing in Zambia, right? where we have a central bank that's completely insulated. Um, which is sad. Uh, the, the question about preconditions, uh, Dr. Hujo, I think when I think about it quite deeply, what I see, this absence of a developmentalist ideology. I mean, I think uh, our colleague from Ethiopia, Dr. Ayob, did a very good job to illustrate just how important such an ideology is in, is in, in the process of you know, uh, putting up a developmental state. Um, uh, you know, uh, Professor Aqua from Ghana, sort of using history, also did make that argument quite forcefully. But what we tend to see now, you know, is this absence of this developmentalist ideology. Uh, ministries of finance uh, are supposed to be technocratic and objective, but essentially are supposed to be engendering efficiency. Uh, to what end, no one knows, in efficiency for efficiency's sake. Right, so this absence of this developmentalist ideology, I think, is one that is an important precondition for me, and one, and I think, our generation has to think quite deeply about, uh, you know, how do we engender this developmentalist ideology, right? How do we escape from these strictures of technocracy that we are in right now? Yeah. So those, I, I'd leave other colleagues to also chime in. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Griever. That was very insightful. I move to um, uh, Dr. Nandongo and Professor Daniela. Would you maybe like to respond to the second question about the current international context and what that means actually for catching up, for developing new industries, for accessing finance and, and, and playing an active developmental role? Dongo, do you want to go first? Please go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I was going to say, okay, thank you. Um, so just to, I, can I just touch very quickly on the question of central banks because I've always studied them and I, I feel like a central bank geek, geek in particular. And just to notice that they are, a, they are the, in, in the neoliberal technocratic machine, they are the most important uh, institution of governance uh, and to, to my mind, one of the most important impediments to a successful developmental ideology, the, the emergence of or re-emergence of a successful developmentalist ideology. Uh, and if we look, for example, at the, at the case of, of Namibia, it will be interesting to study there how the central bank articulates or allow, enables the Namibian government to go beyond simply, you know, issuing green bonds to uh, give uh, foreign investors, uh, some uh, US dollars to purchase to it for, for capital imports. So I think we have to think very carefully about the role of central banks. And also to remember that when Tandika Makandawira talked about both the ideological and the structural uh, aspects of, of the developmental state, he didn't just mean ministries of finance, uh, he also meant central banks and the relationship between the central bank and the, and the ministry of finance and the technocratic capacity of the state to plan industrial policy, to, 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 to design industrial policy, that is a macroeconomic question as well, because it depends on, on how you manage your currency and it depends on how you manage the, the institutions, the local institutions that generate credit, at, usually at preferential rates, in a way that support the emergence of, of national champions. So with, uh, we, could, we should talk about central banks from the beginning and should, we should put it at the center of, of analysis. And that leads me to the second point, which is something that 
not going to explore in more uh, detail in this piece that uh, we have been more or less presenting today in a very disciplined uh, 15 minutes, um, which is we are living in, in, in at, a, at a point where um, not only African countries, but even high income countries are confronted with the hegemony of the US dollar and of US uh, uh, of the US Federal Reserve in dictating financing conditions across the globe, more or less. So we are all as the kind of prisoners and trapped in the global financial cycle. And the consequence of that for particularly for countries in, in Africa and particularly for countries that are trying to work through a developmental mindset or to return to one if they if they have ambitions to do so, this, this return is, go is, is going to be far more difficult in a in the background of the debt crisis that we're looking at. I, I'm convinced that we are looking at very severe debt crisis across across all, across all everywhere, more or less. And, and that, at, in a sense, attentions, I'm not, I'm not a Marxist, but uh, I sometimes believe in, in the concept of accelerating contradictions. It seems we are at in the moment where contradictions are being accelerated. And maybe we don't get the luxury of, of you know, the kind of ideological and structural change that uh, Tandika would have liked to see uh, that for the reemergence of, uh, of a developmental state. So I personally am, am quite worried uh, about prospects, uh, particularly for either progressive economic policy making or for countries that are not the United States to, to basically surf the wave of, of uh, debt, the debt crisis that is coming. Je pense que les, les deux questions sont liées. En fait, la crise actuelle que nous traversons euh, et le rôle que doit le rôle que doivent jouer les, les, les banques centrales. Euh, les banques centrales, hein, comme dit Daniel, doivent être des, des agents du développement économique, donc des agents vraiment des piliers du développement économique, euh, parce que en fait, euh, les banques centrales doivent permettre déjà de, de financer le développement, doivent, doivent permettre ce rôle-là en fait, euh, de créer les conditions pour que des gens, les, en tout cas les champions nationaux ou en tout cas les tissus de PME, PME puissent avoir accès à des financements adéquats, c'est-à-dire euh, des prêts à long terme et aussi voilà, des, des taux d'intérêt qui ne pénalisent pas l'activité économique. Euh, la stabilité financière, bien entendu, c'est très important dans un contexte où il y a une libéralisation des flux de capitaux. Donc, euh, le contrôle des capitaux est vraiment important si euh, les euh, pays veulent avoir un minimum de contrôle, en tout cas sur les conditions domestiques. Et euh, le fait aussi d'avoir des, euh, en tout cas des taux de change entre guillemets plus ou moins compétitifs qui permettent parfois d'exporter à des conditions compétitives et qui permettent également la croissance, la, en fait, la croissance euh, des, des, des salaires réels. Parce que plus les pays s'industrialisent, en fait, plus les coûts salariés vont être élevés. Donc, si ça veut des taux de change qui ne sont pas compétitifs, ça peut aussi euh, freiner la dynamique euh, d'industrialisation. Et donc, euh, aujourd'hui, on est dans un contexte où les banques centrales sont obligées partout de resserrer euh, la politique monétaire parce que c'est dû euh, au système monétaire tel qu'il existe et qui matérialise la domination du système dollar. Et donc, dans ces conditions, comment se déconnecter, c'est très difficile. Il faut les, les contrôles de capitaux, ça c'est sûr, mais il faut également davantage, en fait, euh, euh, mobiliser les ressources euh, financières domestiques. Et ça, c'est possible à travers une organisation, en tout cas, euh, une organisation, du, des meilleures organisations des systèmes financiers domestiques. C'est-à-dire avoir recours au capital financier que lorsque c'est vraiment nécessaire et dans le cadre de projets qui permettront, par exemple, de rembourser la dette qui est contractée en monnaie étrangère ou bien d'assurer le en tout cas, les, le flux de profits et dividendes qui vont sortir. Parce que euh, là, on peut avoir une nouvelle crise de la dette avec des conséquences peut-être plus importantes que ce qu'on a vécu au début des années 80 jusqu'aux, disons, des années 2000. Mais ce qu'il y a également, ce qu'on ne dit pas dans ce débat, c'est qu'en Afrique, nous souffrons beaucoup plus, en tout cas d'un point de vue quantitatif, des euh, flux euh, de profits, de dividendes, etc., qui sortent que du service de la dette. Ça, ça, on ne le dit pas. En fait, quand on regarde les données sur, par exemple, 2000-2018, euh, on voit que euh, les, euh, 
les profits, disons, des, des, cap des capitaux étrangers, les profits transférés ont été supérieurs au service de la dette extérieure. Donc, ça, ce que ça montre, c'est qu'en fait, il y a un problème de capacité domestique parce que si vous ne pouvez pas faire vous-même, d'autres viennent faire, investissent et il y a une partie de votre surplus qui est exportée. Donc, ça veut dire que d'une part, également, les origines de la dette en monnaie étrangère africaine, euh, euh, en fait, euh, euh, s'explique aussi par le fait que ce déficit, disons, de capacité productive amène à des formes d'investissement qui sont un peu extractifs et qui exportent le surplus africain vers, vers, vers l'extérieur. Donc, ça veut dire que euh, pour régler le problème de la dette, il faut nécessairement passer par, par aussi l'industrialisation, mais une industrialisation basée dans la mesure du possible par une maîtrise, disons, du système financier domestique et de l'ouverture, et aussi basée sur une maîtrise de l'ouverture financière. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel and, and Dongo, for, for putting this debate in, in a global context uh, of our global international monetary and financial architecture, and also to make the link between developmental states and, and macroeconomic policy, basically. Uh, before I continue, I would just like to check back with Professor Jimmy, uh, how much time do we have to continue this discussion? Uh, well, we... We're virtually, we, yeah, was, we plan to end at 4.30 and we're ready 20 minutes um, over the time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I'm worried about the interpreters. Fine, okay. Then I would uh, just like to invite um, the, uh, both um, Professor Aqua and uh, uh, Dr. Ayob just to, to, to give us a uh, really a very short uh, final statement in reference to the ongoing uh, debate. Thank you. Professor Agua. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just uh, want to speak to the question which is uh, Could you speak time. up? It's very low. Yeah, can you hear me? Is it better? Maybe a little bit closer to the microphone. Okay, is it better now? This is better, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I would I would like to speak to the question about the debt situation and the rising interest rate. Uh, very briefly, because this is what is confronting us really. Uh, I think it's still very low. We yes, we can yes, hardly hear you. Yes, it's very slow. Um, is it better? Is it better? She has to be more close to the mic. Okay, I think I'll... <laughs> Hello, is it better? No, no. Can we go to the next question? Yeah, sorry, sorry for the technical problem. Um, then please, Dr. Ayop. Okay, uh, just briefly, I think the role of central banks is well addressed, especially by the contribution by Dr. Chalewa that they definitely play a significant role in steering developmentalism, but they are always approached as something that cannot be touched and used for that purpose. I think that needs to be adequately addressed. The debt situation, I think we need to be conscious of, you know, not every African country have, have the same kind of debt structure, right? Whether it is, whether the debt is with World Bank or China or private lenders. For instance, the book that I referred to by, co-authored by one of our panelists, uh, Samba Sell, like the 15, the 14 African states, we cannot really talk, they are on, on, almost on a permanent austerity system because they cannot invest in any way that will challenge the existing bank zone financial logic. So the kind of situation in those 15, 14 African countries is completely different with South of Ethiopia or Nigeria and the like. So I think we need to go deeper into identifying the specific challenge that each African state is facing. In terms of the two specific conditions that you initially asked about how to put in place a developmental system, for me, the ideological element is quite important. And having that internal cohesion among African elites, Dr. Chalewa was talking about to a tech extent, you know, is this neoclassical trained elites, technocrats are kind of in control of most African states. I know this kind of orientation is still very much on the margins of many African political economic system, but 
that kind of ideology, both internally and across countries, is quite important so that we can envision, we can dare to dream something different. The external environment will always remain hostile. The West has been benefiting from the subservient position of Africa stuck in over the past 500 years. So nothing will change now. What needs to change is how we Africans organize ourselves and our states and relate with each other. For me, even the, the FCFTA, the African Free Trade Area, I kind of find it quite problematic because it is specifically focused on you know, trade liberalization, what's happening on the border without giving proper attention to transforming the productive capacities of African states, African economies. It's not just only about you know, the tariff issue, the technical issue, it's the developmental orientation that's always been misconstrued and missing. I think those are the key uh, essential issues that I would just add such in a brief note. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, excellent presentations from all our distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you again for the questions from the audience. Uh, apologies for not being able to uh, give everyone the word and, uh, and post every question. Please refer to the panelists um, you know, for your questions. And thanks again for Kodesria uh, and uh, University of South Africa for co-hosting this for us, for the Tandika family for being with us today and all of you joining in this very exciting debate. I hand over to Jimmy and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kaja. Uh, it's been a long day. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, been a, a long day of rich, uh, what engagement with the theme of this year's Tandikam Kandawiri Memorial Lecture and Roundtable Panel Discussion, worthy of the incisive insights that we derive from Tandika's work, uh, worthy of his of his um, um, you know Pan African commitment and worthy of his infectious optimism about the future of Africa. Uh, on behalf of the Sachi Chair in Social Policy, the University of South Africa, Kodeskri and Onrist, I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, today's uh, events in honor and memory and legacy of Professor Tandika Mkandawire. Uh, having an event such as this one with many moving parts, involves the commitment and hard work of several people. Uh, first, let me thank Professor Fiona Tregena, our keynote speaker, for honoring our invitation and for an excellent <coughs> memorial lecture. Um, I would like to thank our panelists at the roundtable discussion, Dr. Grieve Chawa, uh, Professor Aqua Britum, uh, Dr. Ndongo Sala, uh, Professor Gabriela Gabor, and Dr. Eyob Gebremariam for accepting our invitation and for the excellent presentations. Uh, I thank Professor Tenjue Meiwa, my boss at the University of South Africa, uh, Professor Isabel Casimiro, uh, Paul Ladd for their welcome addresses. Special thanks to Dr. Godwin Morunga and Kaja Ujo for chairing the sessions in excellent manner. My deepest appreciation to members of the planning committee, uh, Bashiru Wen and Olufemi Balogun at Kodesria, uh, Hanli, excuse me, Hanli Volhuta, Doc Mlambo, and Simangele Sitole at UNISA. Uh, finally, I thank Sarah and Beatrice for fa facilitating our communication in English and French in their excellent work of interpretation. Uh, in my language, for every festival that involves feasting, when you thank those who made the meals and organized the event, you must also thank those who came to eat the food. For this, I thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules 
to participate in honoring the memory and legacy of Tandikam Kandawiri. Without you, today will have been a shadow of what we hope for. Thank you all for being part of today's event. Asante sana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, Jimmy. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jimmy. Thank you, Isabel. Nice to see you. Yeah, and you, and you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.